that means in a few years from now, we'll have a whole lot of children who are also professors. Thank you very much. Let me, let me also welcome His Excellency, the Governor of Ebony State. Your Excellency, your dance step on your Thanksgiving Day, I will come and copy it. Congratulations to you, the Governor of Ebony State, Right Honorable Francis Winfrey. I'd like to welcome here the former president of the Senate who is here with us. I'd like to welcome His Excellency Pius, I, I am Pius, I am GCOM. Your Excellency, I welcome you. Thank you very much. Let me welcome all the members of the National Assembly here present. Let me particularly Welcome the Senate Senator Ositango, who is not only representing the Senate Committee Chairman on Power, he's also the uh, Minority Whip of the Senate. I welcome you, Mr. Senator. Okay. <laughs> he's telling me that he's from this state, my co anchor. I'd like to welcome all other members of the National Assembly that are here um, from the House of Representatives. Let me welcome the former Governor of Imo State, Uwile Ruchas Okorocha, who is also here with us. I welcome you. I'd like to welcome very specially the Honorable Minister of Power, Chief Adebayo Adelabu. I welcome you, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much. The Managing Director of the Niger Delta Power Holding Company. Mr. Chiedu Obu is also here. He's also here with us. I welcome you. Let me particularly welcome all the executive directors of the Power Holding Company. Ifeo Luau Yedele, Executive Director of Networks, I welcome you. Babayo Shehu, Executive Director of Finance and Accounts, I welcome you. Mrs. Nkechimba, Executive Director of Corporate Services, I welcome you. Engineer Kashim Abilai, Executive Director of Generation, is there with us, I welcome you. Dr. Stephen Ansenge, MON, Executive Director of Legal Services, I welcome you. We will continue to do the recognitions. I also recognize and welcome um, Distinguished Senator Uche Kunife, the Director General of the Southeast Governance Forum, who is there with us. Uh, the senior senator Osita is an result chairman Senate Committee on Capital Markets. I also welcome you. And let me welcome the senior senator Ifanyo Ba, who is also here with us. But as an elder statesman here, who has contributed so much from the private sector, the chairman of EEDC, Sa Emeka Ofo, is also here with us. I welcome you. So, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue the recognitions, but let me welcome all of you. To Enugu. Let me welcome all of you to the Southeast, the Southeast home to 22 million people covering five states. Although there is party diversity, four parties, but they are still linked by a common ancestry, common purpose, and mutual aspiration. So as I welcome you to this business round table that is focused on lighting up Nigeria. What runs in my mind is that today, even as you look out, the morning sun rises over southeast with a whisper of hope. With this project, a new day dawns, washing away yesterday's sorrows. Like birds, the southeast is ready to soar. Embracing the rhythm and the melody that serenades us with eternal songs of brightness and power. So welcome to the world president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and then the chairman board of directors Niger Delta Power Holding Company Limited. I welcome you to the Southeast. Thank you very much for finding time to be here with us. We are grateful and you look every inch, you look every inch and every man. 
and uh, we are glad to have you. My people, it would be nice to say that his name will be christened. Uh, uh, I think it would be better to ask him as his name is Uche right now because it's God's design. Please welcome once again. Well, we will be moving at a very supersonic speed in order to cover all the things that we have. And I welcome the empty now. It is my pleasure, therefore, to go into this, this event and therefore request thank you, the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of uh, Niger Delta Power Holding Company, Mr. Chiedu Ubo, to please come forward to make the opening remarks and set the stage for this program today. Please, a round of applause to encourage him all together. Thank you. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Chairman of the Board of Directors, Niger Data Power Holding Company Limited, Senator Kashim Shatima, GCON, Your Excellencies, the Governor of Imo State and the Chairman of Southeast Governors Forum, Senator Hope Uzadima, our Chief Host, Dr. Peter Amba, the Governor of Enugu State, Your Excellency, the Governor of Anambra State, Professor Chukuma Soludo, your Excellency, the Governor of Ebony State, Right Honorable Mwifuru, um, distinguished senators here present, the Honorable Minister, kindly permit me to stand on the already established protocol. On behalf of Niger Data Power Holding Company Limited, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Your Excellencies and distinguished guests to this very important event. This event provides an opportunity for the business community in the Southeast, in the Southeast zone, to interact with His Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and also marks the formal launch of the Southeast phase of our strategic collaboration with our project partners to provide steady and reliable electricity supply to industrial and business cl clusters across the country. We are honored to have you all here today. This event is part of a series, a series of initiatives led by His Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who serves as the Chairman of Niger Data Power Holding Company Limited. These initiatives demonstrate the commitment and determination of President Tinubu's administration working through our company, Niger Data Power Holding Company, to provide reliable and sustainable solutions to the electricity challenge in the country, starting with reliable and affordable supply to industries. The first event in this series took place on October 12, 2023, in Agbara, Ogun State, Southwest Nigeria where His Excellency engaged with the business community and, the, and committed to providing the required electricity to power businesses in the industrial areas across the country through our company. Since then, significant progress has been made on the Agbara project, including identifying and signing on key industrial customers, conducting engineering surveys, negotiating transaction agreements and procuring the OEM EPC uh, providers for the required transmission and distribution projects. Additionally, NDPAC has worked very closely with the Transmission Company of Nigeria and the federal government, uh, uh, FGM Power Company, to conduct engineering surveys, identify sites, and acquire a mobile transmission substation for the project. Uh, the Transmission Company of Nigeria has since approved the connection of the new substation to the national grid and efforts are underway to deploy the fast-track transmission substation in Agbara. Today's event builds on the commitment made by His Excellency at the Agbara Roundtable 
and will be replicated in all the geopolitical zones across the country. From here, we are moving directly to northwest zone of the country. The Light Up Nigeria project, which is the focus of today's event, is led by, of course, as I mentioned, Niger Data Power Holding Company. And as you know, Niger Data Power Holding Company is a government-owned company and is responsible for implementing the National Integrated Power Project. And we operate a portfolio of gas thermal electricity generation assets in Nigeria. However, the optimal utilization of these assets has been hindered by some technical challenge, challenges and, of course, market constraints, electricity market constraints. One major challenge is the lack of sufficient transmission and distribution infrastructure to transport uh, generated power from the power plants. To underscore this point, just last Friday, uh, with due respect to Honorable Minister of Power, just last Friday, we received the Honorable Minister of Power at our 500 megawatt Benin uh, Ehogo power plant. This power plant shares the transmission facilities with the private sector power plant, Zuredo power plant, next door, with over 460 megawatts. The two plants together can generate over 900 megawatts. The Honorable Minister witnessed firsthand the level of underutilization of the NDPAC generation plant as a result of uh, transmission uh, uh, constraints. However, the Transmission Company of Nigeria is now working assiduously towards resolving that constraint in that power plant. Another challenge stems from financial difficulties in the electric power sector here in Nigeria, leading to inadequate payments by distribution companies and the Nigerian Bulk Electricity Trading Company to generation companies like NDPAC. The huge indebtedness to the generation companies affects the ability of the, of the companies to pay for gas supply, again leading to gas supply shortage and the resulting low generation. On 31st January 2024, the Honorable Minister of Power visited our Olon Shogo power plant near Papaland to Inogun State and our Motosho power plant near Ore in Odo State. Both power plants were visited in the same day. In fact, we had like an eight hour trip on the road. And the Honorable Minister saw firsthand the extent of gas supply constraints to the two power plants, which, which put together would have generated over 1,000 megawatts. At a recent press conference, the Honorable Minister of Power rightly identified the severe liquidity crisis as a major impediment to electricity supply in the country, with over 1.3 trillion owed to generation companies. And the PAC alone is owed close to 200 billion out of that. These challenges of lack of sufficient transmission and distribution infrastructure and to, uh, to transport electricity from power plants and the sector market liquidity crisis have resulted in gross underutilization of installed generation assets with unserved, unserved potential great electricity consumers, particularly industries, some of which are represented here today, resorting to expensive, very expensive and often inefficient self-generation. In response to that, in response to these challenges, NDPSC initiated the Light Up Nigeria project, which aims to provide reliable and affordable electricity supply to industries and homes by utilizing this underutilized generation capacity, establishing trading agreements with bulk purchasers of electricity like industries, and mobilizing the required investment to addressing the technical, commercial, and collection losses in the supply chain. Additionally, NDPSC aims to receive full payment for the electricity generated and delivered without relying on the federal government for such payments. When we get the payments, we'll be able to pay dividends to your excellencies, the governors, who are also the owners of this company. The project aligns, this project aligns with the Electricity Act 2023, graciously signed into law by His Excellency the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tunibu GCFR, which provides, the law, the Act provides a strong framework for state governments to develop electricity markets at the subnational level with the aim of delivering consistent and affordable electricity to residents. We are here to partner with the states. Through 
the Light Up Nigeria project, state governments will derive the benefit of increased access to electricity, a fraction of investment opportunities, revenue generation, and economic growth. At the federal level, the project will help to reduce the financial burden on the federal government's balance sheet from the debt exposure of the federal government buck trader embed. The project is further reinforced. This project is further reinforced by next the Regulatory Commission's MITO multi-year tariff order 2024, which mandates distribution companies to secure adequate bilateral contracts and exit from contractual relationships with the federal government bulk trader embed. NDPSC remains at the forefront in pursuing bilateral electric power sales and other projects that ensure efficient and targeted electricity delivery to industrial end users. On behalf of the management and staff of NDPSC and the project parties, I stand here this morning to assure your excellencies and the Southeast business community that the Light Up Nigeria project will have the, the dedicated and diligent attention of the team of Niger Data Power Company and its project parties, devising very creative and bankable solutions to addressing power supply challenges to industries in this zone. We are grateful for the support the tremendous support and leadership of His Excellency, the Vice President, as the Chairman of our Board. In this, in this roadshow event, we also extend our appreciation to Your Excellencies, the Governors, especially uh, here today, present here today, for your support to NDPSC projects in your respective states. Special thanks to the Governor of Enugu State, uh, the chief host for this event for providing this uh, a venue. We would also like to express our gratitude to the Enugu uh, Electricity Distribution Company, our project partners, uh, represented by its chairman here, Sir Emeka Ofo. We are grateful to NRX1, Electric Utilities Limited, and our other private sector partners, professional advisors, and the South East business community for your presence and anticipated contribution to this roundtable. We are very excited about the collaboration and opportunities that lie ahead. Together we can make a significant impact on the electric power sector and contribute to the growth and development of our nation. Thank you for being a part of this journey with us. Once again, welcome to this roadshow event. We hope it will be informative, engaging, and fruitful for all involved. Thank you very much and God bless you. God bless you too. Can we put our hands together one more time for this amazing man? What you are doing with your management team and staff is amazing. We say thank you to you. Thank you. Let me also say thank you to all the key stakeholders that are part of this. Enugu Electricity a Distribution Company is here. We say thank you. Gensos Power, NRX1, EUL, and the consumers that are here. All of you within the electricity ecosystem, we say thank you to you. Earlier, while the Managing Director and Chief Executive was um, addressing us, he referred to Edo State in Benin. But I also took away a few lines where the Honorable Minister said, Light Up Nigeria is a project that is doable. He also said, to have 24 hours power for our people going forward is also doable. He's here with us. He's the Honorable Minister of Power. Please welcome here, Chief Adebayo Adelabo. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Senator Kashim Shetima, GCON. Your Excellency, our host governor, the governor of Enugu State. Your Excellencies, the governors of Imo, Anombra, and Eboyi. The former President of the Senate, 
and the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Senator Ayim Pius Ayim, former governors here present, distinguished senators, honorable members of the House of Representatives, I can see the Chairman of the House Committee on Power, the Managing Director and Executive Management of Niger Delta Power Holding Company, distinguished invited guests, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be attending this event, the launching of the Southeast Phase of the Light Up Nigeria Project, an initiative of Niger Delta Power Holding Company Limited and its project parties to deliver reliable and quality power supply to industries one cluster at a time. I was privileged to have also attended and taken part in the pilot event at the Agbara Industrial Cluster in Ogun State on the 12th of October, 2023. I was a witness to the charge by, uh, by His Excellency, the Vice President of Federal Gulf of Nigeria to Niger Delta Power Holding Company and the project parties to apply diligent efforts to achieve the objectives of this project and promise the institutional support of the federal government of Nigeria. It is gratifying to see that we are here today to have this interaction with business and government in the southeast states of Nigeria and flag off the activities that we see to the resolution of the power supply challenges of industries in southeast Nigeria. The Light Up Southeast project has been structured to resolve the major challenges in the Nigerian electricity supply industry since the privatization in 2013. Number one, the lingering infrastructural constraints, especially in the transmission and distribution networks. This is an accumulated problem that has been there in the past decades, which we have not fully attended to. And we believe that for us to have a stable, functional, reliable, and uninterrupted electricity, it must be dealt with, especially the evacuation of power generated by the Transmission Company of Nigeria and distribution of this power to the doorsteps of households, businesses, and industries. Secondly, we have experienced liquidity constraints manifested in payment deficits across the various value chains, from payment for gas supply to payment for power delivered at distribution level. I mentioned in one of my press conferences about two weeks ago that presently we are owing about 1.3 trillion naira to the power generation companies and about 1.3 billion dollars to the gas supply companies pre-2014. If you add these two together, at the, today's exchange rates is in excess of 3 trillion naira. Which sector will operate effectively and efficiently with a debt overhang close to 4 trillion naira? This is something that we need to address if we must move forward. And which is actually the reason why the sector has not been attractive to new investors, both locally and internationally. We also need debt equity, debt capital rather, in this sector. Which bank will be bold enough to put its money in the sector where there is no line of sight on how this money will be paid back? So a lot of the lenders have distanced themselves from this sector, which is a major issue. The Light Up Southeast will attract financing for required infrastructure upgrades and we use metering and the related technology to achieve payment assurance. We are going to do things differently here. We will prove to the investors that if you put your money in this project, you are going to get your money back. That investment recovery assurance is required. And the banks too will be willing because we are going to use technology especially smart meters to ensure that we collect uh, electricity bills 
from consumers. The key objective is to enable industries achieve savings from the exorbitant cost of self-generation and increase their output through a renewed focus on their core business operations. Today, over 50% of industries, due to the instability in our electricity sector, they are completely off-grid. They now have captive powers in their factories where they generate power of their own. You can imagine the number of industries that we have, and they have their own separate power generating plants. Fine, it gives them stable power, but it is not economically viable for us as a country, because every other thing actually pass on to the cost of goods produced and eventually transfer to the pricing of these commodities, which is a major driver of the inflation that we have been seeing in food, commodity, and service prices across the length and breadth of Nigeria. Components of the project will include designing, financing, developing, operating, and managing last mile distribution and, where necessary, transmission infrastructure to secure safe and reliable delivery to the customer's premises. We want to ensure a seamless operation of the entire value chain from generation to long distance transportation and to delivery, which is the distribution to end consumers. The Light Up Nigeria project is also designed as a bilateral sales solution that will move away from the bulk purchase arrangement with the Nigeria Bulk Electricity Trading Company, MBET, to more bankable bilateral sales that will achieve, number one, efficient power dispatch that minimizes technical losses through newly built or upgrade of transmission and distribution infrastructure with protections against unauthorized connections or network-wide defaults. In the process of transporting power or transmitting power, using the technical term, a lot of power is lost because of deteriorated infrastructure that we have. But in this project, we are going to ensure that we carry out an upgrade of the transmission and distribution infrastructures to ensure that technical losses are actually minimized in the process of uh, transporting or transmitting power. There will also be full contract payments using technology and smart metering, among other mechanisms that minimize or eliminate commercial losses. This commercial or collection losses is highly prevalent in our industry. The average loss that we have today in terms of bills not collected is about 52%. If you want to actually zero it to specific distribution companies, we have discos that have commercial collection losses as high as 75%, which means about three quarter of the bills sent out are not collected. We cannot guarantee the continuity and sustainability of this sector in this manner. So it's actually the collective efforts of the power sector players and even the consumers that can transform this sector. We have our roles to play, but the consumers also have a great role to play. If you are asking for stable and functional electricity, you must be able to pay your bills. If you don't pay your bill, it leads to grinding to zero the operations of the power sector players. So we don't need it. The value chain must be able to operate uh, uninterrupted. Economic development through the reduction in energy cost for industries and homes. This is also one of the major benefits of this project. If the cost of energy to both our households, to businesses, to institutions, both educational and health institutions, and to industries, if it is low, prices of goods and services will also come down. And this will improve the purchasing power of household income. I'm going to get value for our Naira. Our Naira becomes appreciating and the store of value function of Naira comes back unlike what we currently experience. The benefits of the project will include, number one, savings in the federal government of Nigeria, public expenditure or subsidies and intervention projects. Number two, 
significant savings in the energy costs for target large-scale industry and residential consumers, which I've also talked about. Three, enable upscaling of production capacities by the industrial customers with increased export trading opportunities and foreign exchange earnings. This is quite logical. Once we have stable and functional electricity that's quite affordable, it's going to improve our production levels. Apart from achieving... Foreign currency earnings, which will improve from the supply side, the stock of our foreign currency, and also improve the value of the Naira. Infrastructural development in the new build facilities that will be commissioned. And lastly, job creation, skills, technology, and knowledge transfer. Job creation especially. We have a very high rate of unemployment. And we know that it is because a lot of industries have packed up. A lot of companies have folded. And they have retrenched their staff. Even small businesses cannot develop because they require power. The artisans have turned to Okada drivers, Okada riders. If this is restored, we believe we are going to reverse this ugly trend. And there will be jobs for our people. Once there are jobs for our people, there will be enough purchasing capacity of our citizens. And I believe they will all go well for the economy. To conclude, I'm here, therefore, to provide assurance to the business community that the Light Up Southeast project will be pursued diligently to achieve its objectives. I will invite your cooperation as the project moves towards implementation. But before I leave this podium, there are three issues I want to talk about in three minutes. It is when you look at the problems that we have in the power sector today, they look so simple. Improving our generation capacity, improving our evacuation to transmission, improving our transmission grid, improving the distribution infrastructure, reducing our meter gap. These are simple, simple issues. But before me, there have been over 40 ministers of power. Why are we still at this level? Why are we still revolving around 3,000 to 4,000 megawatts of power for over 200 million people? South Korea, with just about 49 million people, produce, produces 130,000 megawatts of power. The Republic of China, with 1.4 billion people, produce 1.3 million megawatts of power. Even South Africa produces about 54, 55,000 megawatts of power. But since I was a child, I've been hearing about 4,000. Today, I am approaching 53. We are still on the 4,000 megawatts, which means that the problem goes beyond the simple surface issues. There must be fundamental issues with this sector. It is those fundamental issues that this administration is trying to address so that we can bring lasting, enduring, sustainable solution to the power sector. And our industries will grow in leaps and bounds. But the issue is we need time. We need patience, we need trust, and we need confidence. So the value chain commercial efficiency is what we needed to assure, ensure sustainability and continuity of this sector. If any sector is not operating on the natural commercial flow, it is always a problem. The moment government pledges to intervene, these pledges must come in handy, prompt, and fully cash back. The liquidity provision for funding and investment for infrastructural upgrade and expansion is needed. Power investment is no small investment. To build a 132 kV substation or a 330 kV substation today, we are talking nothing less than $50 million. To build a 100 kilometers of high voltage power line of 132 or 330 kV, it's in hundreds of million dollars. So we need investment, both equity cash injection and debt capital. So this industry must be attractive, must be attractive to both local and foreign investors and as well as bankers. It must be attractive to them. 
Lastly, sir, we want to appeal to power consumers in the southeast. We want to appeal to my excellencies, the governors of the southeast, to help this sector. There are some peculiar issues that we experience more in the southeast area, and you must help us to address those issues. Number one, even though this is general across the nation, is vandalization. It is only in Nigeria that we will deliberately destroy our national assets, power assets, bringing down power, transmission towers, bringing down transmission lines. Why will we not experience Greek collapse? This is even more prevalent in the northern part of the country. Apart from the transmission power assets, we have distribution power assets. People go into transformers, they loot them. They also loot our substations. We need protection of this asset for us to guarantee uninterrupted power supply. And lastly is the issue of right of way, which is most peculiar to the Southeast. I must be frank and truthful. We have a number of completed transmission substations here that we cannot energize. They've been there for five years, 10 years. Even the items in there have been looted. Why? We cannot energize them because we could not connect the transmission power lines. And the main issue is right of way. We find it difficult to install our power lines in the southeast. If we come for enumeration to determine who and who are we going to pay compensation to, for us to be able to install power lines. If you go back to Abuja with 100 households with structures under the power lines, by the time we come back, the structure will have increased to 1,000. And out of this 1,000, shrines will be about 100. And they will force us that we must pay to the gods before we can actually clear. So we have lots and lots of abandoned transmission projects, which include substations and transmission power lines. We need this for us to move forward. So with this, I want to thank you for the support, your excellencies, and uh, I wish us a very fruitful deliberation. Thank you for your kind attention. An eloquent rendition there from the Honorable Minister. If you don't mind, may we give him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We shall be moving fast. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, permit me to introduce a man who broke an over two decades of water scarcity in Enugu City, more than 40 years, and he came and promised 180 days, even before then it was achieved. And the round of applause will make him happy. Thank you. Permit me, therefore, to introduce the founder of Pinnacle Oil and Gas Limited, leader of Nigeria downstream sector. And I'm sure that this Light Up Nigeria will be very beneficial to organizations like that. But beyond that, it is necessary for me to introduce the Sun Newspaper Governor of the Year 2023. I'll introduce the Vanguard Newspaper Governor of the Year 2023. I introduce the New Telegraph Governor of the Year 2023. I also introduce the man who has converted a new city to a project site where over 81 road projects are, are being undertaken. The man building a new Enugu city that you can as well see as it is rotated there. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the governor of Enugu state, His Excellency, Dr. Peter Ndubisimba, will now come forward to welcome our guests and address the assemblage. Your Excellency, sir. Welcome once again, sir. Thank you. His Excellency, Senator Kashim Shetima, GCON. Your Excellency, 
the governors of Imo State and Chairman Southeast Governors Forum, Senator Hope Uzodima, CON. Your Excellency Anambra State Governor Professor Charles Chukuma Sududu, CFR. Your Excellency Eboin State Governor Right Honorable Francis Mwifu. Your Excellency, former Senate President, distinguished Senator Ayim Pius Ayim, GCON. Your Excellency, the former Governor of Imo State, Owele Ruchas Ukorocha, the Chairman Senate Committee on Power, ably represented by Senator Ostangu and other distinguished senators that are here present. The Chairman House Committee on Power and other members of the House of Representatives here present. The DG Southeast Governors Forum, Senator Uche Kunife. The Honorable Minister of Power, Federal Republic of Nigeria, Chief Adebayo Adelabu. The MDCEO, Niger Delta Power Holding Company, Mr. Chiedu Ubo. Senior officers of security agencies here are revered royal fathers, heads of boards, agencies, institutions, and parastatals, captains of industry, project partners that are here, top government functionaries, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, let me, on behalf of the government and the good people of Enugu State, and also on behalf of my brothers, the Southeast Governors, bid you welcome to the homeland of Ndibu. We bid you welcome to the historic city of uh, this country. As your excellency would know, Enugu state is a consequential state and has played various historic roles in the development of our country. So I want to truly bid you welcome. It is indeed also my honor to welcome all our invited guests to this occasion of the launch of the Niger Delta Power Holding Company Innovative Light Up Nigeria project. Thank you all for honoring this invitation to flag off the project in the Southeast. Again, I want to most especially express our honor to welcome his Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, to Enugu on this his maiden visit as the Vice President. We're certainly proud to have you here in our midst today. It is no secret how busy your schedule typically is, but we know it is even busier still on this occasion given your other engagements in ABA today. For you to be here with us underlines your professionalism and deep interest in the progress of the private sector. While this may not be surprising, given your background in the private sector, it is still most heartwarming, and we do not take it for granted. Thank you, Your Excellency. Today, we are flagging off what is, in my view, a new dawn for the power sector in the Southeast. And one of the most innovative initiatives 
in the power sector, the Light Up Nigerian project. This project is of critical importance since it deals with the power sector, which I believe is pivotal to economic growth. Indeed, if we fixed power, a lot of other sectors would have fallen into place. This project ensures efficient dispatch of power to the largest consumer by bilateral sales agreement, removing the existing bottlenecks of bulk purchase arrangement through NBET. And it leverages on a willing buyer, willing seller's structure. The program will certainly bring improved access to reliable and affordable power to the southeast. This will in turn result in reduced power costs for the productive sector and enable them improve productivity and generate jobs. We can all agree that this is critical in this day where the country is pushing to boost production and drive up exports to ultimately shore up our domestic currency. This project aligns completely with our approach to governance in Enugu in the sense that it is a very disruptive initiative. And typically, when we talk about disruptive innovation, we are we're quite aligned with it because it, 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 it means that we have to basically think outside the box. We must look at disruptive way of interrogating the status quo. And basically coming out with, it could be a business model. It doesn't necessarily always have to be component. We can also disrupt a business model and create value. And this is to me what this reflects. So we are indeed happy to be associated with this. Uh, not just from the point of view of Enugu, but also from the southeast uh, point of view, as a region with a compact economy. Uh, someone said 22 million, but we're far more than 22 million. We're actually 20, more than 27 million. You know, living within a landmass of less than 30,000 square kilometers. So you can say, in terms of population density. Outside Lagos, we're the most densely populated region in the country, living within 30,000 square kilometers and having a market size of 27 million people. You cannot beat this. The opportunities are here. The, the, however, what these parties, we saw this when we actually sought the mandate of our people in Enugu State. When we clearly set out our objectives and goals, which of course came across to many people as ambitious, we were convinced beyond doubt that governance today requires thinking outside the box, that we must depart from the business as usual model and which was why we made very consequential pronouncements on the day of our inauguration and saying that ours would be business unusual, business unusual. It is this same school of thought that informs this program, which is why we're gathered here to flag off this project today. It is initiative like this that would drive our economy in Enugu and indeed in the southeast to hit its stated objective in terms of industrial growth, GDP growth, and the eradication of poverty. This is because access to affordable power goes to the root of improving the ease of doing business in any economy and thus enhances private sector investment. In line with this, we must deeply thank his Excellency, the Vice President, as well as the leadership of the NDPHC for coming up with this winning strategy. It could not have come at a better time than now, 
when we absolutely need to boost our productivity in the country to strengthen our local currency and the economy at large. For our own part, we commit to continue to support industrialists and other private sector across our state to complement the undeniable boost that this program will bring them. We shall continue our efforts towards growing various cross-sectoral business clusters in the state, both by consolidating upon the existing business parks in the state and by accelerating new clusters, such as the special agro-processing zones. It is also my hope that this program, which will see the emergence of islands of power availability within the southeast, will also provide a stepping stone for the smaller power users to key in and assess more reliable power supply. I would like to take advantage of this platform to encourage other investors in the power value chain to redouble their efforts to prefer responsive solutions to the current problems of the power sector by deploying their innovative faculties in the way that NDPHC has just done. This could be in the areas of improving power supply or reducing technical or commercial losses. All of these will go a long way in improving the delivery of affordable power to the last mile and bringing to fruition the great economic potentials of this country. In closing, let me enjoin our industrialists who are well represented here today to fully key into and take advantage of this initiative to remove any bottlenecks that are facing regarding power availability. Long have we lamented our situation with respect to power supply. The government, through NDPHC, has now listened to our cries and stretched forth their hands in support. Let us not miss this opportunity. Let today go down in history as the turning point for our story regarding power supply in the Southeast. Thank you very much for honoring this call. I wish us a fruitful time here. Thank you and God bless you. Your Excellencies, <laughs> while they, they are trying to sort out the microphone, I'd like to welcome here the House Committee, Federal House of Representatives Committee Chairman on Power, Right Honorable Victor Mokolo. He's here with us. I welcome you. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is intentional in our leadership. On all fronts, he has demonstrated a sense of humanity anchored on responsibility, accountability, and prudence. His achievements cover education, infrastructure, security, and health. He has formed the cloud industrial clusters that are integrated, and I understand he has signed an MOU with EEDC to bring light to a number of states. And then somebody asked him, when you leave, what will you want to be remembered for? And he said, all I want is that when I'm gone, they could look back and say, I have turned a number of states into a livable homeland. I'd like to welcome here. Professor Chukuma Saludo, Governor of Anambra State.
much. Um, Your Excellency, the Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, my colleague Excellencies, we've been uh, warned that um, I'm sure the Excellency is uh, about to rush out. So all protocols duly observed. Um, I looked at the program and we're supposed to speak five, five minutes each. So our host governor, I'm sure, has spoken for and on behalf of all of us. So I'm only here to say just a few words of footnotes in solidarity. First point, Your Excellency, is to join my voice in welcoming you to the political capital of the Southeast, Enugu, Nigeria. Um, this is a regional program, a regional program by the MPDC on the light of Nigeria. And it's quite auspicious that it's being held in the political capital of the Southeast, Enugu, which is also where I live. So I want to welcome you as a co-host and um, also my home. My governor has spoken, um, he's a resident, um, as it were. Having said that, the one quick thing I want to say while well, I commending the federal government and the MPDC for this initiative, I want to say that enough of the book of lamentations. I mean, I listened to the first few speeches and quite a lot of lamentations, lamentations. Let's move from lamentations to solutions now. And I want to believe that this particular session, at the end of it, will come out with actionable, executable agenda to provide power to our people. We will know the problems, Honorable Minister. On Saturday, you enumerated all of them. I almost had a heart attack. Uh, the MD, long list of them and so on. Let's focus on getting the solutions here. In Anambra, we have a mantra that the solution is here. And within this room, and with all the people gathered here, at the end of this session, but we come out with actionable agenda. And I say that I don't want to, I mean, go back to the issue of the importance of electricity. It's a driver for everything. You know, it's like the American Express. You don't leave home without it. Nothing else will happen without power. Yes, and I want to commend the National Assembly and our governors. We have done something as part of the solution, and which is removing electricity from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list, so that governors in their respective states can now create viable competitive electricity markets. That's part of the solution. And I want to commend everyone who has played a role in making this to happen. For us, Southeast, EEDC is here, and it's quite auspicious that it is today that you'll be going to commission the geometrics in our back. Um, pushed by one of our illustrious sons, Professor Barton Naj. I would dare to say Barton Naj is from Enugu State here. But he's been on this project for maybe more than 15 years. And finally, I salute his doggedness and determination that finally, after more than 15 years, going up and down and down and so on, I follow the trajectory of that. Today, you are going there to commission this. This is part of the kind of solution embedded captive power in clusters that we need the and the solution actually overarching solution framework is strategic partnerships strategic partnerships partnerships between the federal mpdc the private sector and the states each doing their own part I'm also glad that the chairman of EEDC, board of EEDC is here. It's not just powering the EEDC. In Anambra, Your Excellency, you were there a few months ago. 
to commission the 1.4 million uh, metering company. I mean, they produce 1.4 million meters per annum. And provide the power and meter it. It's as simple. We are doing quite a whole lot on our own state. The electricity bill or law will soon be passed. But beyond just passing the law, we've worked hard to develop electricity policy that will create a, viam, a vibrant market for everyone to operate. But we need to unlock one other thing that is in the exclusive list. That's gas. Gas. To have the electricity come out from the exclusive list into the concurrent legislative list without gas, <laughs> federal government still having a stranglehold on gas, that's a challenge. So the Honorable Minister, when you go home, put it in your own to-do list. We should go back to National Assembly to unbundle it and take out gas from the exclusive list and put it into the concurrent legislative list. Anambra has abundance of gas. But we can't take it and provide power for our people. We need electricity. At best of time, we get about 112 megawatts of electricity in Anambra. That's barely 40 watts per person per hour. Impossible. Anambra is an industrial hub. We have the second smallest landmass after Lagos. Um, second highest population density after Lagos. Some will say the industrial commercial hub of the southeast. But without power, we can't. We have invested, we've named the days and so on and so forth as the one doing uncommon stuff in terms of infrastructure, but not in the area. In power, we've done the more, we are doing the much we can. But we need the partnerships to work. So I want to say, Dear friends, yeah, the ease of doing business. And the last one, the Alhambra was ranked number one out of the 17 southern states. But power, power, we could do everything to fix all the areas of doing business. Without power, that's not going to work. So today, I want to say, dear friends, the solution agenda, the solution agenda is here let us in this room when we leave come with two three four actionable agenda what ndpc must take home with what the federal government will help us more with what the private sector the eedc will sign an mou they're doing their bit we need the transmission companies here they're being the transmission lines uh, a few of them in anambra but they need the connectivity you are right off where we'll give you that we are guaranteed that in Anambra. So that's not any problem. Let's solve them and unleash on this. Let's light up the Southeast. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Where there is saludo, there is solution. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, the Vice President, let me again welcome the Governor of uh, Ebony State. As you know, Ebony State was created out of Enugu State. And uh, it will not be surprising to have what we are doing in Enugu State, we are doing it in Ebony State. For instance, his Excellency Governor Mwifru has established a lot of things in Ebony State to make the state more governable. Digital transformation, e-government, which is also happening in the state. The civil servants are rejoicing because he's there as the governor. Today, there is a people's charter of, need, charter of needs that he is promoting in Ebony State, which is making every member of that state to smile. Ladies and gentlemen, as I welcome him and congratulate him on his victory at the Supreme Court recently, I now ask that His Excellency Governor Francis Mifru will now take this time. Please, a round of applause to welcome him. Thank you, Your Excellency.
Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria, distinguished stakeholders, let me stand on the already established protocol. Excellency, the Vice President, I'm very delighted to be part of those that welcome you today in Enugu. In Ebony, we believe the people's chapter of need, and electricity is part of it. But we don't believe in good English and speaking grammar at all times. We believe in proper implementation of what we say. So I want to urge you, Mr. Vice President, and the stakeholders in this power industry, to believe in implementing whatever thing we say today, rather than coming here to speak English, and at the end of the day, we achieve nothing. Two. You talk about light. There is no way people will be willing to pay for electricity with a lot of estimated beer. People will never be willing to pay. You must be able to come out from that cubicle believing that definitely they must understand you. Nobody is ready to understand you. People are getting of edge. They are getting to know that, yes, it is time for us to pay for the value of what we use. And I'm urging the Minister of Power. I'm very delighted, very excited when I next to him. The way he talked about the impediment of this great industry encouraged me that yes, if opportunity is given to him, he will provide solution. And I'm very grateful to welcome you. And I say, may God Almighty guide you and direct you peacefully in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. You know, somebody once said that brevity is the salt of oratory. He kept it straight to the point. I'm not surprised. A boy is the salt of the nation. Uh, let's put our hands together for His Excellency the Governor. And so finally, we'll be going to our final, the, the next Governor, before we invite His Excellency the Vice President. Your Excellency, this man has equipped over 100,000 Imo young people with digital skills. Power he's working on it education is his focus no wonder there's a slogan of skill up emo as far as he's concerned for as long as he's governor hope will be alive so your excellency distinguished ladies and gentlemen from massive infrastructural development to soft skills the man is keeping hope alive in emo state please join us and welcome the chairman of the southeast governance forum the governor of Imo State, as he takes a very hopeful step to hear His Excellency Senator Hope was our man. Your Excellency, the Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria. Most distinguished Senator Kashim Shetima, GCON. Your Excellencies, my brothers, governors of Southeast region, members of the National Assembly, very important invited dignitaries here seated, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by formally on behalf of the government and people of Southeast region, to welcome our amiable Vice President and to thank him for the support he has given to this region since he emerged as Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And through him, extend our warm felicitations to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tinimbu, 
GCFR. Today is a remarkable very day that we are here to support the federal government through Niger Delta Power Holding Company to at least discuss and listen to stakeholders something that should ordinarily give us hope. At the end of the day, the Light Up Nigeria project, after being flagged off in Lagos, and the second flag off is happening here in Enugu, our regional capital, for such a national project. I listened to my dear brother, the governor of Enugu State. He presented a well-articulated speech to this august body. And reasonably, that represents really the interest and position of us here in Southeast. I listened to the Minister of Power, just like my brother Governor of Anambra State noted. He rolled out the impediments that has not made Nigeria people have steady and robust supply of power to our businesses and homes. And the governor of Ebo State summarized it. The truth of the matter, there are sometimes there are questions that are capable of provoking genuine interest to our people in Nigeria. In 1998, the power holding company of Nigeria was generating over 6,000 megawatts of power. By 1999 to 2007, the federal government of Nigeria spent over 13 billion dollars from taxpayers' money to develop the power sector. By 2024, 78% of the homes and the industries in Nigeria have no access to power. Something is definitely wrong. There is a need for a comprehensive audit of decisions taken in the past where we have gotten it right and where we didn't get it right so that we will start from the known to the unknown the people of southeast are hard-working people very enterprising people unfortunately 85 percent of the industries in southeast are closed down for lack of power and this is a zone that is richly endowed by god with natural resources. You talk of gas. It is in the Niger Delta Formation. Kwisat East Zone is part of it. You talk of oil. It is in this formation. It is, is it because of our inability to manage our natural resources or what? The connection between generation, transmission, and distribution is supposed to be an internal protocol. It is not what you come here to discuss with the stakeholders. The simple arithmetic here is demand and the supply. You give us power, and we will pay for the power. You have shown that over the years, that government after government has not been able to give power to the people. Nine months ago, President Bora Tinimbu came to power as president with Senator Kashin Chetima, GCON, as his vice. And all of us here in this room and in Nigeria expect them to solve this problem of power that have lingered for 45 years in seven months. If truth must be told, are we being reasonable? 
So I think that we must wear our thinking cap and ask some questions. Because this is our common patrimony. The money being spent is being spent for and on behalf of me and you. So the managers of this sector, the beneficiaries of this sector, I think you can be, if you create a situation whereby you are happy and Nigerians are happy. Can we allow for a win-win situation where power must get to our homes and our industries? Today, a bag of cement is 13,000. If we have power in Enkelago, Niger Sen will be working. If we have power in Enugu, the coal company will be working. Our rail system is still working in those ancient manner because of lack of power. We are not here to discuss the need for power supply in Nigeria. We are here to tell some of us the home truth that we should wear our thinking cap and give Nigerians power. From taxpayers' money, a lot of money has been spent. The managers of this sector, please wake up and help us do justice so that God will forgive all of us. Thank you. Your Excellency, I say, man, God will forgive all of us. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in 1909, coal was discovered in Enugu. What this says, in terms of what we are doing here today, is that there's already a naturally given power source before we are starting to light up Nigeria. Let me welcome here my friend and brother, the Controller General of Customs, Mr. Dewale Bashir Adeni, who is here with us. I welcome you. Thank you very much. He, he just winked at me now that all the money you need for the power sector, Customs will bring it. <laughs> so like I said, 1909, coal was discovered, power was waiting for power. But I'm very happy here that the field marshal of Light Up Nigeria is here in our midst. He's a friend of the Southeast. We both gave him a title. So Igbo land, your friend is here. And as you step on this ground, he shall bless you. I shall welcome here. His Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria, President Kashim Shatima Jizue. my profound gratitude to our host governor, Dr. Peter Mba, for the defining the meaning and concept of modern governance in any state. What binds us together so far whatever the devices? Forget about politics. We are talking of governance. Taps are flowing in Enugu. And I will be back here to commission your smart schools. Okay. And the South East has never had it so good with leadership at the subnational levels. The governors are doing excellently well. Your Excellency, the Governor of Enugu State, Dr. Peter Amba. Your Excellency, the Governor of Imo State and Chairman South East Governors Forum, Governor Hobozo Dima. Your Excellency, the Governor of Anambra State, Professor Chukuma Soludo. Your Excellency, the Governor of Eboyi State, 
He reminds me of Paul Kagame, very stern looking, like the headmaster, right honorable Francis Ngufo. Former Senate President, Senator Ayim Paris Ayim GCON, distinguished and honorable members of the National Assembly present, particularly Senator Osita Ngu, Senator Ifyanyu Uba, Senator Osita Izunaso, my very good friend. <laughs> and right honorable Victor Wokolo, Chairman House Committee on Power. Senator Wokolo, your business is not about constituency projects. Come and ensure the light of the East materializes. The Honorable Minister of Power, Chief Adebayo Adelago. The Deputy Chief of Staff to the President, Senator Ibrahim Hassan Hadija. My very good friend who has come all the way to witness this function, the Comptroller General of Customs, Bashir Adewale Adeni. My other very good friend with whom I came here, Oweli Rochas Anayo Okorocha, the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, Niger Delta Power Holding Company, Mr. Joseph Chiedu Uko, and the management team of the company, the Director General of the South East Governors Forum, EO, Distinguished Senator Lilian Uche Konike, and of course, Distinguished Senator Ipia Uba is listening with rapt attention whether I will miss out his name or, or not. Members of the Enugu State Executive and Security Council present, captains of industry, especially the elder statesman, Sir Imeka Ofo, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are again to fulfill yet another promise. Here we are to reassure you of our responsibility for the industrial expansion of this nation. I am thrilled to witness the second launch of the strategic collaboration between the Niger Delta Power Holding Company and its invaluable partners. We gather here today to embark on a transformative journey, the launch of the Light of Nigeria project in the southeastern states. This marks a renewal of hope for industrialists, for investors, and for the homes that have long endured the consequences of Nigeria's power supply deficit. When we initiated the pilot project with the business roundtable at the Akbara industrial area on October 12, 2023, we engaged major investors and industrialists from Akbara Ogun State and neighboring clusters in Oyo and Lagos states who are sure of our direction in pursuit of the priority set by His Excellency, President Bola Ahmad Tinubu. And the dream under construction attracts us to this historic city of coals and industries. The Light of Nigeria project powers the hope of our industrialists and serves as a long-awaited solution to the power supply deficit that has undermined our economy over the past decades. So this intervention even a ribbon cutting charade. This is a calculated end to re engineer our economy. And whatever we design to oil the wheels of our industries is futile unless we stabilize the Nigerian electricity supply industry. Power is known for any industrial tech up. And we'll talk from now till eternity about industries. If there is no power, we are just engaging in exercising utility. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I bear the mandate of President Tinubu to assure you that the project transcends real trade. The South East is an industrial powerhouse, and its economic fortunes remains a critical priority of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. The governor of Enugu State quoted a figure of 27 million of the people living in the South East. I beg to differ with you. The inhabitants of the southeast might not be less than 35 million. And if South Swiss walks, Nigeria walks. <laughs> A 
Ali Al Amin Mazwi, at the risk of sounding repetitive, at the risk of sounding repetitive, described the Igbos as the Nigerian Jews, geographically mobile, economically enterprising, and educationally ambitious. Part of the whole. Beyond having the hope of the nation here in our midst, the hope of the nation rests with Ndivo. We are mightily proud of the Ndivo. It's a very proud and industrious people. I feel at home in Enugu. Give me land, give land to the president. We'll develop homes in Enugu because Enugu is home. The practicality of this project is woven into the public of NDPHS's illustrious track record, a testament to the exceptional collaboration with esteemed partners such as TCN, EEDC, Enerix One Limited, and Gen Source Power Limited. This alliance has been pivotal in achieving the success we proudly acknowledge today. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I had to intervene about a week ago with the MD of the NDPHC over some dates that one of the discourse is going. I said, no, we cannot afford to cut off the South East from power supply. The little they are getting must be sustained and even jacked up further. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that President Bola Ahmad Tinubu means well for the nation, means well for Ndivo, means well for the Southeast. And the governors, you may like to demonize them, but the governors of the South is are some of the best in the nation. Who have looked at the larger interests of the nation over and beyond the local interests. And I believe in the fullness of time, posterity will judge Dr. Peter Mba kindly. Posterity will judge Governor Hope Uzodima kindly. Posterity will judge Professor Chukuma Soludo kindly. Posterity will judge Right Honorable Francis Nguyenkuru Kagame very kindly. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not here. Posterity will judge Alex Oti kindly. We'll support it, you with, with all the resources at our disposal. We have to make the South East work. I have come to the South East at the instruction of the President more than any part of the country. I have been to Anambra, I think, three or four times. I have been to Imo. It's in Ugu that I am coming for the first time. But right now we are proceeding to Abia to commission Geometrics power station owned by the elder statesman Professor Bart Naj. And we are going to commission. I'm coming back to Enugu to represent the president and cut the ribbon for the smart school initiative. Education is the greatest game changer. Within a generation, the son of a peasant can be a celebrated icon. So let's invest in education, especially on the girl child education. And after this meeting, I will have a brief meeting because we are targeting the Southeast for the IDIS program where we hope to create two million jobs for women and youth. Together, we are going to reach the promise now. I want to thank you most sincerely for the warm reception accorded me. And honestly, from the bottom my heart. I feel at home here.
I'm closer to the southeastern governors than, than, than some of my northern brothers, honestly. I'm very much at home. These are my friends, these are my brothers, these are my contemporaries, including the northern evil seated here. Oele Rochas and I all Thank you so much. He is well and truly in the Igbo, friend of the Igbos. Your Excellency, we thank you. You are home. My colleague said we should work on some Igbo names for you. We'll set up a committee to drop a white paper. So, Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to wrap up before we go into the Years experience covering both public and private sectors. Please join us a welcome. This is Chikunyelo Mba. Okay, Chikunyelo. Okay, Chikunyelo Mba. Your Excellency. The Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, more particularly, the Chairman of the Board of Directors of NDPHC. Your Excellency, no. Alwa, Maje, Deje, Imela, Tokuhu. I agree to you because in Igbo, this is my homeland. Your Excellency, the land is a spirit. It hears your heart. And this land will bless you. Because you have a heart for the people, not just the Igbo people, but the Nigerian people. I've, I've worked under you a couple of months now, and I've seen the sense of urgency that you bring to bear on the things that are important and critical for survival as a nation. Again, I ask that this land bless you in the name of Jesus. I salute their excellencies, the five wise men of the East. It's never been a better time for us. I'm so happy, so proud, because we're living in the season of the renaissance of the spirit of Desam and the spirit of Jim. They're at work now. We see gallant men of vision doing great things for our people. Anibo gadim manakunu naha Jesus. Your Excellency, before I thank our partners, I would like to introduce you to my brothers. Umunem, Ndide, they're seated over there. The men of legendary accomplishments in business and commerce and industry. Even Harvard University teaches a course on the Igbo business commercial system. And there, I think we have like two generations seated over there from the Chica Sins and all the sins and sins and the younger ones. And then, of course, the female, indeed, the Hanoka here, Lady Dozi, is in the room. So proud of my sisters doing great things in the world of business. I want to thank, on behalf of the management and staff of Niger Delta Power Holding Company, uh, project partners, the key stakeholders that so have lined up and are supporting um, the Light of Nigeria project. The chairman of NERCO, even though he isn't here, the MD of TCN, and more particularly, the one that's become my best friend recently, he's the MD of FGN Power. 
Mr. Kenny Ahue. I told him today that we're going to dance before he leaves this place. He's FGM Power. He's the um, agency behind the trans transformers that we're taking to Abara. And he's here to see the need we have here. And when we have this dance, he'll give me all the transformers that I need for my people and my land. Thank you, Kenny, for being here. So very grateful. We are taking off in the network system of EEDC. The chairman of EEDC is here. He's opened up his network. He's promised us that we can work together, set up a partnership with light up the light up team and EEDC to ensure that all of the off-takers that sign up to take power from this uh, initiative, there's improved efficiency, better dispatch, and a whole le new level of professionalism. Thank you for welcoming us into your network. I want to thank our project partners, Enerix, EUL, GenSource. I want to thank Skipper GTA, he's seated over there. He's taking off the Abara project for us, and he's deploying, he's assured us, first week of March, he's on ground in Abara, and hopefully in the next three months, Your Excellency. Sorry, it took a little longer, but learning curves. This one will do faster because we've learned a couple of things. Sorry? Your Excellency, I'm not going to make you another promise and break it. Please. Please. Six months, sir. Okay, then, then, then the MD. MD is day and night. Four months, Honorable Minister. Okay, so. Kenny, you're hearing this, right? So, yes. Your Excellency, the Vice President, Your Excellencies, I stand here to commit that we'll do this in four months. We've, we'll have some lessons learned, particularly from procurement, and that is why I drag my friend and my colleague, uh, uh, the FGM Power Company here, and the, the MD of TCN, who are our partners in this pro progress, and we are working directly with, uh, with the Honorable Minister to achieve this. Uh, we assure you that in four months, we'll, we'll have lessons learned. We'll follow. We'll, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my dance partner. Thank you, Excellencies. Your wish is my command, sir. We will do as you requested. Uh, all of the resources uh, that are the behest of the Honourable Minister of Power, uh, on the, uh, of course, are our own um, mandate uh, under the Presidential Power Initiative. We'll make them available to the NDPHC without any further ado. Thank you, sir. And so, to my brothers, I'm wrapping up very quickly. Honorable Christian Udechuku, I want to thank you. Thank you so very much. The first time we came in here, your spirit, your drive, your encouragement. Listen, um, to all of my brothers, the industrialists that are here, if you look around the room, you find out that almost all the regulators in the Nigerian business ecosystem are in this room today at the invitation of His Excellency the Vice President. And the reason is really simple. All of the issues, the bottlenecks that you experience along the line of doing business, he's seated here today ready as he was in Abara to tackle all of them. So whatever issues beyond power that you have that get in the way of your efficiency and your productivity, that's what the business round table is. But if you also look around, you'll notice that the Attorney General is not here. So this is not a political conference. They will not be taking questions on new local governments. So anything that it gets in the way of your doing business, His Excellency is here. He wants things working. He wants problems solved. Please, I thank you especially, Chairman Southeast Governors Forum, Odenibo, and tomorrow is here. Thank you for such gracious hosting. Dalunu, 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 divine, uneme kofuma. Darlene, I'm so very proud and happy. Thank you. Your Excellency, no, oh, I got the log in my, I need to go go ziggy. Fabuniti, I like a big game with you. Chineke gan on your logi. 
as you have a heart for us, the spirit of our land is with you. You will go further, faster, stronger. Ogadilugima. Every time she speaks, she gives me reason to hope, and at times she brings tears out of my eyes. I don't know why those mixed emotions come after she speaks. Can we give her a motherly round of applause? <laughs> so very quickly, we'll move on to the round table. I will first of all bring on the youngest person that will be on that table, our moderator. Uh, Chuku Bika Neto, where are you? The moderator is an extremely intelligent young man. Uh, you will go on stage because the governors have not sat down, you'll be standing. <laughs> right and so let me welcome now the excellencies. Um, the governor of Enugu State, please, I welcome you to take your seat on the stage. The governor of Anambra State, the governor of Imo State, the governor of Ebony State, please, can we rise to be part of the business for round table, please? The MD and the Honorable Minister of Power, you are part of this. the Vice President, Your Excellencies, all the Governors of the South East States, and all the members on the round table, welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, very quickly, we are very mindful of the fact that His Excellency the Vice President has um, a very busy schedule for today, so we'll try to make this as efficient as possible. This is also important um, to get the feedback from the business community. So, very quickly, the way it will work is that um, I would invite any one of the business community present, any representative who would like to uh, give some a comment, feedback, a request. The Vice President has graciously given us essentially a blank check to bring up whatever, whatever the issues are for us. And um, he and any other member of the team, as the esteemed persons on the panel that he delegates will also address any of those issues. So the floor is open, and at this moment, with the Vice President's kind permission, I would invite anyone who would like to speak on behalf of any of the business communities here present. If you could just indicate, and I would move from there. If you could please introduce yourself. I believe I, you were the first hand I saw. The organization you represent, and very quickly, please, your question. Your Excellency, the Vice President, and Your Excellency, the Governors, my name is Charles Obulogo. I'm Vice Chancellor of Marika University, a new university located between Enuguan and Soka. I'm excited that power has been unbundled, that power has been taken away from the exclusive list and not concurrent. The university we are running is a mega university and it spans across 5,500 hectares. But one major challenge we have is no electricity crosses that line. We make our power, we use our diesel, we use our gas, we use our solar energy, and um, it becomes a very exorbitant thing because we intend to make sure 
education, which is primary, is critical to our people, we intend to have a connection with this agency. And we learned there's a new rapprochement happening around Nike Resorts. We are appealing at this stage if we can have a connection between Enugu and Usuka so that our axis will be covered, so that our power will be maximized, so that we can provide education at a good cost. Please help us. Thank you. May I ask Your Excellency, sir, if your preference would be to have all of the comments first before we re respond. Okay, thank you. Please. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, my name is Lady Ada Chukuduze, and I'm the Chairman of Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, representing Anambra, Enugu, and the Boni State. Um, us is to express our gratitude, our excitement and optimistic. We are very, very grateful to have been given the opportunity to say something here. And we are very, very happy that you visited us in the southeast region. We are very, very excited that government is innovatively um, pro providing disruptive solutions to a problem that has bothered us so much. We are also very, very optimistic that this particular initiative is going to work out very well. We are impressed that you are driving this initiative by yourself. We are also very impressed that you deemed it fit to launch it in other regions other than your own region. And that shows that you're a true Nigeria and that also shows that you have good sterling leadership qualities that should be emulated. So we appreciate your open-mindedness, we appreciate your passion, and we appreciate your commitment towards the economic development, progress, and prosperity of Nigeria. Now, coming from the manufacturers, there are a lot of challenges that bedevil us. And um, this issue of power is very critical and pivotal because it is the energy that drives other sectors. Other governors have, in the past, I must acknowledge, done something about this. Um, the, it has also been said here about the effort of our governor, Governor Chukuma Charles Soludo, and uh, in partnership with EEDC, which is yielding fruits. And I think other governors are doing something in that direction. But this particular light up Nigeria is like um, renewed hope for us. And we want to assure you that we are ready to collaborate with you in all ramifications. Um, currently, the issue, there is a dead need for government to pay attention to productivity. Productivity, not just for food sufficiency, but productivity um, in terms of growing the food and commodities, that is resource-based productivity. And this resource-based productivity, if government pays true attention to it, by first of all, providing security for farmers to go to their farmlands, providing incentives for them, providing uh, farming implements, then there will be enough production of uh, food and commodity which will um, engender export um, export export uh, oriented industrialization um, rural industrialization um, resource based industrialization and also import substitution industrialization and with the import uh, substitution industrialization 
if government can support manufacturers who have, are producing locally, support the use of locally produced goods, and then use the interplay of uh, barriers, tariff barriers and quotas to encourage these local manufacturers. A case in study is uh, um, uh, Innocent Group, who is currently producing motor vehicles. If Nigeria can support locally produced goods, I think it will go a long way. Outside this, there is need for government to look into the tariff from custom especially as it concerns manufacturers if it is possible give us an incentive that is exclusive to manufacturers so that our raw materials our machines can come in at a reduced um, duty duty so this alone can also help engender productivity in the country um, just to round up, I want to plead that manufacturers also be considered um, man manufacturers be, be considered in, in a way that sourcing foreign exchange will come easy for them. Thank you so very much, Your Excellency. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. May I just ask everyone please to be a little more efficient with time so that we can get everyone covered one moment you will be next please go ahead yes all right yes. okay uh ladies and gentlemen uh good afternoon and uh, uh your excellency vice president the excellency governors and the honorable minister of power adilabu and the md of uh, uh ndbgc yes and uh, first, uh, uh, let me introduce myself briefly. And my name is Robin. We come from China Machinery Engineering Corporation, CMAC. Uh -huh. Our company come to Nigeria more than uh, 20 years, since the 1990s. Uh -huh. And uh, also for Vice President, it is our honor to invite you to our country, China, last year during the One Build and One Shield initiative. And uh, our present uh, uh, Chinese President Mr. Xi is very honored to meet with you and have fulfilled discussion uh, between two countries and two leaders. Uh, and uh, uh, we are the EPC contractor and development partner in Nigeria for more than 20 years. We built Zunggelo uh, Hydropower, uh -huh, the largest hydropower plant in Nigeria. Uh, and also we started the uh, build the Omotosho power plant, uh, phase one, phase two. And also, President, uh, Vice President Shetima uh, went to, yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, uh, my, I want to express our greetings and readiness that we are on behalf of the China, and we are also honored to be invited as the uh, uh, only Chinese partner here uh, to use our facility and uh, resources uh, uh, from China and to make more contribution in the field of power. This is our, what we want to express our gratitude here. Thank you. His Excellency, the Vice President, and the Governors, my name is Balarebe Abdullahi, the MD of Saloguru Nigeria Limited. Yeah, it will interest you today to know some things that you don't know. I, standing here, wrote the first memo to the president, Olusegun Obasanjo. Then, we should come out of the box. Just like the Honorable Minister said, when we are small, 2,000 megawatts, I'm 60, 2,000 megawatts, something is wrong somewhere. I took the initiative, I wrote him that you can't get light with Nigerian budget. Using Nigerian budget, you can get light. You get light when you establish an organization that has nothing to do with Nigerian budget. Pump in money there and you will get light. Because the contractors will give you the light on time. 
money. When you don't have money, you can't get light. Because the contractor will go to the site, he will borrow the money, he will do the work, come back with his invoice, no payment because of budget. So you can see why we said, pump in money there. And the money was pumped into independent power project. Then, I was happy, we have um, more than 15,000 megawatts from Niger Data Power Holding. So in Nigeria, we have light. But change of government. You know, when somebody don't understand how it works, you can't get it. When President Buhari came in then, former president, I was in the stand with him when he said, $16 billion was released. Where is the light? After eight years, he has gone. We are still asking, where is the light? It will surprise you to know that I made an independent investigation. 16 billion was never released to Niger Data Power Holding. The MD is standing there. It is 8 billion. Also. Until you find out who kept or who is keeping the balance 8 billion dollars, then you will now start getting light. NDPSC has, is able, they are there, the MD is there, to give Nigeria 15,000 megawatts. I have been proven right. Ministry of Power cannot give Nigeria up till today one megawatts for 40 years. So it means give the money and you get light. Recognize the contractor and you will get light. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. My name is Ambassador Odin Wosu. I'm the Deputy President of NASMI. I also used to work, I'm the co-founder of Kutix PLC in the industrial town of Newe, Anambra State. Thank you, Your Excellency, for affording us this opportunity to exchange ideas with you. Because of your time, I will only deal with two major things. One is in whatever is being used to power Nigeria, they should buy locally made products for these things. The second thing is, because of the poverty level in Nigeria, please phase removal of subsidy on electricity. And the third thing that I would like to say is, in all the major decisions, please bring in the private sector so that they can introduce some ideas on how things can be done to fit the population. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I will apologize in advance, everyone. There's going to be a cutoff at some point. His Excellency, the Vice President, still has a very busy day, but I believe you would be next. Your Excellency, Vice President of the Federal Republic, our governors, Honorable Minister, my name is Henry Ifaim Mbadiwe, and I am the Registrar of the Chartered Institute of Project Managers of Nigeria. We regulate project management in Nigeria, and I am coming from a different angle, sir. Sir, and it is the angle of human capital development. Sir, these machineries and all of these constructions would not power themselves and would not work themselves. The entire plan relies on good planning. The entire project relies on good planning, change management, risk management, stakeholder management. Sir, this is our job. And we are willing to work with this initiative and every other initiative to ensure that we bring power to the power sector. Our project managers are local and we have that skill set to be able to join forces with all stakeholders in the Federal Republic to bring power to the Southeast and every part of Nigeria. Thank you, sir. 
Your Excellency, the Vice President and Your Excellencies, I am very impressed with this statement of Governor Saludo for solutions. Though everyone has spoken excellent and I am close to most of you, sir. My name is Jitendra Sachdeva. I am the chairman of Skipa. Dangote refinery, 480 megawatt combined cycle was completed in spite of COVID in the half years and today it is fully operational power plant. A power infrastructure having 190 power transformers is fully operational. What this gentleman said, sir, the combination of resources and planning. There is no problem of resources in Nigeria. Sir, my request to you today, let us have a combined committee of the Ministry of Power and NDPSC under your leadership. Every month review, make a timeline of one year, there will be a lot of change, sir. Make a mix of private sector, government and project reviews every month. The whole nation will come to the right track, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Um, again, just for the last time, I'm so sorry. I'm going to take two more questions. And please, I'll give priority to the local business leaders around. And then we will go on to the esteemed table. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, the Vice President. Your Excellency, the Governors. Um, Your Excellency, the Vice President, I felt so excited when you made us know that the Controller General of Customs is your personal friend. In fact, my name is Ifani Okoye. I'm the CEO of Joel Nigeria Limited, one of the few manufacturing companies in the Southeast. We suffer a lot from customs, most especially when goods come from Lagos to the Southeast. In fact, I'll use my personal experience as a personal with my personal experience just this early this February a rented truck by my company was accosted by customs on the way and delayed for one week for nothing we were transporting imported already imported goods by different merchants in Lagos down to our factory for manufacturing this truck was accosted and held for one week no reasons. The goods, the um, list of goods the truck was carrying was given to them. They checked everything and took the truck to their place and kept it for one week. We were forced to pay 200 and something thousand naira. No reason whatsoever. Maybe I had somebody said, this company don't see them, which was not acceptable at all. I want you to use your good office, Your Excellency. I'm very glad the custom boss is here to get them to know that we down here must have to move goods from Lagos down here for our own good. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, this is the last question. And again, I apologize to everyone. The rest of the team will be available to continue to address other concerns. But go ahead, please. You will be the last. Okay. Thank you. Your Excellency, the Vice President, Your Excellencies, the Governors. My name is Kingsley Eze. Um, I'm from Enugu State. I, I represent a holding company, a family holding company that uh, recently um, started investing in manufacturing. And we've set up our first manufacturing plant in Nigeria. And I give this, these details for a reason. Um, as a new entrant in the manufacturing space, as we speak, we have ordered a plant that is... Um, Two plants actually making delivery of one power plant that is just slightly under two million dollars. And as I sit here listening to some of these wonderful um, ideas of you know this partnership that will help you know solve the power problem, I'm wondering what happens to this investment? How quickly is this thing going to happen? How soon are we going to get this um, solution that will help us um, take off the burden of 
generating power for ourselves and then focus on, on the business of manufacturing. So I'd like to have information around timelines. I mean, it, I think it's going to be very helpful. Then the second one is quite a number of things have been said around how the availability of gas in the southeast will help things. Um, I also, I mean, I have my views about, you know, how, how that has challenged, you know, um, um, production in Nigeria, uh, particularly in the southeast. And I would like to know, is there any practical, is there anything in the works that is going to solve that problem? Is, is the federal government seeing that as a challenge, as one of the key challenges they need to tackle as a way of, you know, dealing with the, you know, the, the challenge of opening up the productive capacity of Nigeria? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Your Excellency, I've been told that EEDC would make a very short comment or question, and that will most definitely be the last. Please proceed, sir. Your yeah, Excellencies, um, uh, please permit me to stand on the established protocol. Uh, my name is Kester Enwerodu. I'm a director of um, EEDC. The initiative we come here today is actually anchored on the ability of EEDC to take in the power that is going to be generated by NDPHC. So it became necessary for us to voice out some of the constraints we have and our ability to be able to match what NDPHC is trying to provide to our people. Yeah. There are three issues I'm going to highlight on. The first one is the constraint we have on transmission. Today, no matter how much, why we have the Aloji power plant, which has capacity of generating 1,000 megawatts, only taking out less than 200 megawatts is issue of transmission. Meanwhile, we here in Southeast, all we get is less than 300 megawatts. Meanwhile, we have a power plant next to us that has stranded 800 megawatts that has not been taken. I'll give you an example, Your Excellency. In Imo State, a population of five, six million people. We have only one transmission station, just one for the whole of the state. See, it makes it impossible. Even if you bring in power into a substation today, it becomes impossible for EEDC to wield that power to the different parts of the state, far flung like Olo, like Okiwe, and the rest of them, all drawing from 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 Olo, from um, Ebu power, Ebu substation. So we will, um, we will um, advise that we sit down with um, NDPHC and TCN and look at how to optimize the, the transmission network they have here. On our own part, we have taken that initiative to do what we call a high voltage distribution network to be able to link some of the power points, which I believe in collaboration with yes, we'll be having that discussion with them, faster way of delivering. That's number one, Your Excellency. Number two, what we call an operation. Yeah. Number two is a serious problem we are having as EEDC, which has made it difficult for us to serve our people. And is, I would say it's actually a, a, our issue. It's not, it doesn't cut across all the other discourse. In Abara, where you commissioned the, the first light of Lagos, they have, like, Eco Disco have, has an ATC and C of about 25%. And it's important. It's important, please. Uh, 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 right. So, what, what I'm trying to, where, where, I'm, where I'm landing is, as of today, EADC is working on 25% ATC and C loss level. That's what the regulator has given to us. While, in actual fact, the ATC and C gap is about 42 percent. What you are talking about here is a gap of over 100 billion naira. So what we are saying in essence is that EEDC should subsidize 100 billion naira for the market. You and me know that it's impossible for them to do that. And like the Honorable Minister mentioned his address earlier, he stated that we haven't been able to move from 4,000 to, to a higher capacity all this while. For just one reason. Everything we are doing is based on wrong assumptions. And all of us, good enough, uh, I could see at the panel, they are all private sector people. You know, if you walk from wrong assumption, there's no... Welcome back from the live telecast. 
We will now continue with our regular programs. Stay tuned. Watching TV News at one. Our top stories this hour. Federal High Court Abuja Jones ruling on bail application filed by Inam Dekano to the 19th of March. Federal government meets organized labor over planned protest occasion by economic challenges in the country. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shatayi announces his resignation of his government over escalating violence in occupied West Bank. Coming up in sports, Liverpool's celebrating style after defeating Chelsea in the Carabao Cup final. The Federal High Court in Abuja has adjourned till the 19th of March for ruling on the bail application filed by the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra in Abdekano and the terrorism and treasonable felony charges against him. Mr. Kano, who has been in the custody of the DSS since 2021, is praying the court to admit him to bail in line with Section 161 of the ACGA. Uh, counsel to Mr. Kano, Aloy Hijimako, highlighted before the court the medical conditions of the defendant. The medical challenges of Mr. Kano include serious heart condition, acute hypertension, and auditory impairment. The counsel to the federal government objected to the application for bail and submitted that there is nothing before the court to show that the medications being given to Mr. Kano by his DSS uh, are ineffective. He noted that the defendant had jumped bail and there was nothing in his affidavit to show that he will not do the same. He asked the court to dismiss the bill application and grant accelerated hearing to the case. The court will commence trial on the 20th of March. Our judicial correspondent Celestina Iria joins me now live from Abuja to discuss events that have transpired in court today uh, during hearing. Celestina, do you consider it strange that both parties are changing their counsel at this time? And what do you think could have informed it? Well, Nifem, may not necessarily strange because uh, every client is entitled to a counsel he or she feels will best canvas their case before the court. Although we know before now, Mike Ozekome, senior advocate of Nigeria, was the one handling the defense of Nam Nakanu, but today we saw that uh, his counsel was changed. Reasons were not given. We asked uh, the new counsel that what was the reason behind the change of counsel. And he said that uh, it's at the discretion of the client. And also today, the federal government changed its counsel to a senior advocate of Nigeria, Adeboika Awumolo. So this may be strategic to them for their cases, but it's not uh, something new. It's a practice that every, every client or defendant can at any point in time of their trial decide to change their counsel. If maybe they feel, uh, for reasons best known to them, it may be because the, the previous counsel is not doing a good job, or they believe this new cancer will do a better job, or probably strategic. So, but it's not something strange or new to the legal uh, professional practice. So, Lassina, you know, the camera has been wearing the same Fendi outfit since last year. Well, since the last time I remember him coming to court. What's the story behind this cloth? Uh, well, as funny as it may seem, it's a, actually a serious issue. He was arrested. He was arrested in 2021 and that outfit at which he was arrested in is what he's still putting on up to this very moment. Although this is his first appearance after the Supreme Court had ordered that he return to the Federal High Court for his trial. Before today, uh, Justice Bintar Yanku, which is the judge of the Federal High Court where he's being charged, has ordered that the DS has allowed him change of clothes. But now the county has insisted that he will only wear his traditional attire, which is attributed to the Igbo culture.
But and that issue was also raised today at the courts where Justice Binta said that she would not allow any attire that is attributed to any custom or tradition, that he can be allowed to wear plain clothes, plain colors, that uh, if he insists on wearing traditional attire, he should continue to come in a particular uh, attire or particular cloth he's putting on. So she, al she told the DSA that DSA should allow Mr. Kanu change of clothes. And also his cancer has raised, had raised issues as to the challenges they face when they go to see him in the detention facility of the DSS because they said that he is being kept in a 10 by 10 room, being isolated, and they as cancer do not have the opportunity to sit down and have a talk with him because and according to the cancer that the place is being wired or they are saying or they will be discussing is being heard by the DSS. And before they even come into the facility, whatever documents they bring is being photocopied. So they really do not have a time to actually plan their defense because whatever strategy they would come up with with Mr. Kanu, before they leave the DSS facility, it will be known to the DSS. So he mm. came as a web application before the courts, asking the court to stop the DSS from doing all of these things to them and their clients. So the Supreme Court last year restored Mr. Kanu's trial after uh, dismissing the judgment of the Court of Appeal free in the IPOP leader. Uh, the implication of that is that we're back at the High Court in Abuja. But talk to us about what this means uh, for this process. Is it starting all over again? The process of the trial at the Federal High Court will not start de nouveau because it was actually put on hold when Mr. Khan and Mr. Kano and his counsel informed the Federal High Court that they will be appealing the ruling of Justice Binta and Yanko. So the trial court actually stayed proceedings where the matter was taken to the Court of Appeal, where the Court of Appeal entirely dismissed the charges against Mr. Kano on grounds of the actions carried out by the federal government. According to the Court of Appeal, it faulted the federal government for extraordinarily renditioning Mr. Kano to, from Kenya to Nigeria. But at the Supreme Court, the court said that uh, if Mr. Kano was not pleased with the process at which he was brought back to the country, uh, he should go by way of fundamental right enforcement suit. But that action or that act by the federal government cannot uh, declare or make the trial a nullity of the charges. So what we are having now at the Federal High Court is a continuation from where the court had initially stopped. The court uh, dismissed uh, struck out eight count charges, leaving seven. Initially it was 15. So at that, at that time, it was an issue of the propriety of the charge. So now, Justice Binta Yanku has said that uh, on the 20th of March, the trial will commence. On the 19th, the application for being moved by Mr. Kano's counsel, will, the ruling will be taken on that day because, according to them, Mr. Kano is suffering from a serious health and medical conditions, and the DSS yes. will, is not able to provide him the medical attention he requires. Celestina area live for us in Abuja studio. Good to see you, Celestina. And now I had the planned nationwide strike by organized labor over the economic challenges in the country. A meeting between the federal government and the leadership of the Nigeria Labor Congress, as well as the Trade Union Congress, is underway in the nation's capital. On Sunday, the Nigeria Labor Congress had insisted there is no going back on the planned two day nationwide protest over the state of the economy. And this follows several calls for organized labor to shelve its strike scheduled for Tuesday and Wednesday, the 27th and 28th of February, respectively. Our correspondent, Joke Adisa, uh, joins me for update on the proposed strike by organized labor. I understand we'll get back to Joke uh, subsequently. As the federal government continues to put measures in place to stabilize the economy, President Tinubu has established an economic advisory committee comprising the federal government, subnationals, and the private sector. This was the outcome of talks between the president and key personnel at the State House of Abuja. President Tinubu says the goal is to provide additional efforts in stabilizing the economy and ensuring the best economic future for Nigerians. Like I said many times, the people of this country are only the people we have to please. And we are very much concerned from the student to 
mothers, fathers, the farmers, the traders, and realizing that every one of us, we have to fetch water from the same well. We are looking for additional efforts that might help the downtrodden Nigerians and we will provide that hope and the assurance that the economic recovery is on its way. About 48 hours after ECOWAS resolutions lifting economic sanctions on the Nigeria Republic and directing the reopening of the border, the border is still closed. In Jibia, the main border between Casina State and Nigeria Republic, it's looking deserted, while officials at the border post are awaiting further directives. But there's already a positive reaction following announcement by ECOWAS to lift sanctions as businesses and other trans-border activities are already gearing up to resume. Jibia border is one of the major land borders in the country where serious trans-border activities take place. Some people interviewed at the border post expressed their joy and expectation. Coming up on TVC News at 1, six lawmakers of Zamfara State House of Assembly suspend 16 other members over alleged plan to impeach Speaker of the House. With Glovo, you order anything you want and when you receive it, you celebrate it with your whole body. Because when that tasty grilled chicken is here, the weekend starts. The ingredients for your favorite recipe, just in time. And when the cake arrives, the party is on. Because receiving anything on Glovo deserves a dance. Download the app, order anything you want and track it minute by minute until it arrives. Glovo, order anything, we deliver in minutes. On the chicken cube for great chicken taste and aroma. Our top stories of this hour. Federal High Court Abuja adjourns ruling on bill application filed by Namdi Kanu the 19th of March. Federal government meets organized labor over planned protest occasioned by economic challenges in the country. Outside Nigeria, Palestinian Prime Minister Mohamed Shatai announces resignation of his government over escalating violence in occupied West Bank. And Liverpool celebrate in style after defeating Chelsea in the Carabao Cup final. Seven out of the 24 members of the Zamfara State House of Assembly this morning suspended 16 members who threatened to impeach the Speaker of the House last Thursday. They accused members for breaking into the offices of the Clerk of the House and Sergeant at Am. The House, under the leadership of the Speaker, described as illegal the legislative seating led by the 18 members last Thursday. The 16 members had last Thursday... Uh, evening, suspended the Speaker of the House over his long absence amidst the resurgence of armed bandit activities in the state. The six lawmakers in their separate presentations are today sitting accused some politicians outside the state of sponsoring 18 lawmakers to disrupt the government of Governor 
Daud Alawal. To call on the director of TSS, Zambra State Office, to investigate on the above stated issues and afford it is report to Office of the Zambra State Attorney General and the Commissioner of Justice for onward prosecution before a court of law. My colleagues, the only members, it is the wish of this honorable house, uh, dozens of us say I just again say the eyes. A silly Zamfara Governor Dauda Lawa has condemned the recent attack on communities in Zumi and Bini Mogaji local government councils. He affirmed his administration's commitment to end the lingering security challenges. Armed bandits that last week attacked Zumi and Nasarawa Gode in Zumi and Bini Mogaji local government areas. A police officer was killed with houses and shops raised. The visit, according to Governor Lawal is to commensurate with the victims and families of those who lost their loved ones. Dr. Lawal also directed that relief materials be given to the affected communities. I feel as a responsible governor to come here and see for myself what happened with the aim of commensurating with the society as well as providing certain relief for them in the meantime. As a result, some people lost their lives while some are still in captivity. We are committed to your security as well as safety of your properties. The government will never relent in our effort to make sure we provide adequate security. As predicted by many political pundits of a tight contest among the three main contenders in the 2023 presidential election, the February 25th poll came with all these elements. TVC's political desk takes a review of this unique poll where the winner, Bola Tinobo, won 36.61% of the total votes, having fulfilled the constitutional requirements to be declared winner. Tinobu Bola Ahmed of the APC having satisfied the requirements of the law is hereby declared the winner in the build up to the February 25th poll the atmosphere was tense with supporters of being candidates throwing jabs at one another of the preferred candidates winning former governor of Lagos State was the candidate of the all progressive congress Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar was the flag bearer of the People's Democratic Party and former Governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, was the presidential hopeful of the Labour Party. As always, we will engage with stakeholders across the board to ensure a more participatory approach so that the exercise is seamless. The electoral umpire against all odds to postpone the exercise shocked many by standing with the February 25th date. As expected, the exercise was not without challenges, especially with the deployed equipment, with IRF temporarily set aside, resulting to the manual coalition signed by party agents. And the few challenges that we are facing and the steps that we have, take, uh, we have taken to address those challenges is the currency issue. And again, we had an engagement yesterday with the governor of the central bank. In his recently released reports, INEC insists that the exercise showcases the unparalleled diversity following the successful in party representation, demonstrating significant democratic progress. At the presidential poll, the three candidates had the highest votes in 12 states each, including Abuja, while NMPP Senator Rabiu Musa Kokwaso had the highest votes in Kano. This election generally saw four political parties winning gubernatorial races. Seven parties winning the senatorial seats, eight in the federal constituencies, and nine in state legislatures, illustrating a broad shift in the political representation across Nigeria. Anybody will come, he go say, he don't go back, stand, 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 fight, and they give money. No thanks to the Naya crunch, which almost marred the process and could have altered the scheduled dates 
But INEC was resolute that the dates are sacrosanct, unlike in the past, where dates were changed even few hours to the dates. If the proper is messed up, what do you think you... While some political analysts and politicians disagree with INEC scoring itself high, the Commission may yet boast that the overwhelming outcome of the courts validating the election, especially in the governorship poll, is a full proof of the process credibility. Ayodele Uzubako, TVC News, Abuja. Grums manager of Yaga Africa, Paul James, joins me now to analyze the 2023 election one year after. Mr. James, thank you for joining us on the news this hour. So, INEC is saying that its bimodal voter accreditation system technology recorded 98% success rate in the last election. Uh, what has Yaga identified as the improvement in, in the last general election? Well, I think if there is one thing we must comment, INEC is, I mean, that they had come up this time to provide reports of, uh, if you like, what has happened from the presidential election. But to say this is happening one year after the election, I think it's a long time, especially if you are in the business of building confidence in the process that uh, ended with a lot of uh, different uh, dissenting opinions about how it was conducted. Yes, uh, based on the report that we had received from that election as well, we can confirm that this uh, the bimodal voter accreditation device did work well. But it was beyond the conversation of the beavers. It's about the technology deployment in the election. If you recall, what has happened in that election was that the results of the presidential election were delayed. As of 10 p.m. on the day of the presidential election, none of these results have been uploaded. In fact, as of the day that Anek declared the winner, that is 1st of March, um, only 73% of those results have been uploaded. The statement by INEC on the 26th of February stated that uh, it experienced some glitches. Nigeria had asked questions in the last one year. What, has, what were those glitches? The commission didn't come out to say anything until about two days ago when it released its own report from the election's uh, engagement. But beyond that conversation is that in the last one year, if you look at INEC performance, I would say it has been oscillating. There was complaints from the presidential election. INEC improved in the March 18 election. And then subsequent election that followed, if you follow the trend in the November 11th election that happened in Koji, Imo, and Bayasa State, there were complaints from Imo and Koji State especially. In Koji was an election where we saw by the morning of the election that, that there were pre field results that were seen mostly in polling units in uh, Koji Central. In Imo, based on the report that we had gathered at the Aga Africa, elections were not conducted in 12% of our sample polling units. We have sampled 300 polling units across the state. Some of these polling units were even location that ANEC had told us before the election that they would go conduct the election. A place like also local government, where we thought there were security challenges. I, I mean, what we all expected from the commission, they are all humans like us. We can also understand these issues. We thought the commission would have also managed public I hear you clearly, Mr. Risk. James, but allow me to take you back to the presidential election, you know, so that we can just review what has happened you know, for that exercise one year after. You talked about IREV. I think it's very clear from the position of INEC and the court that um, IREV isn't um, as relevant as was widely reported to determine the credibility of this election, especially where the results are concerned and how it was announced. But speak to us about the percentage of votes that, you know, uh, made the winner uh, returned elected. 36.61% of total vote cast. What does that say? you know, about um, the, the participation and then how does it reflect, you know, the intention of voters ahead of this exercise? Well, before I go to that, to answer the question on the IRF, I think there is a moral question we need to answer here. Before the elections, I never raised a lot of hopes that they were going to deploy technology. So the point I had made earlier is that if there are challenges with the technology, we expect the commission to have come out to tell Nigerians what had happened, not to give all this young people before they will come out to have those conversations. Beyond that is also the point, I mean, what we have just asked also. Turnout in the election was just 27%. But if you look also, there are a lot of factors that could have impacted the turnout. Your reporter earlier mentioned the cash crunch that had happened before the election, but also we had reports of uh, voter suppression across several states 
in Lagos, for instance, the morning of the election, there was this oral court festival that happened in the morning of the election that scared some voters from going out to participate. Here yeah, at the end, about uh, if you look at the percentage of votes that went to the winner, about 36 percent or there about the total vote cast. But like I said, there are also other factors that we need to look at. But it, this may also speak to the competitive nature of our elections now. This is the first election in a long time in over a decade that you have like three major parties contesting in the election, if you like. If you look at the other two elections that have been contested in 2011, 2015, 2019, they were majorly contested by two parties. But now I think this is where we have the votes divided. So we had the challenge, like I said, of uh, some of the factors that inhibited the conduct of the election, insecurity, for instance, across several states in the country, the challenge also of technology that happened in the election, they could also have uh, dampened citizens' confidence in the process and may possibly have affected turnout in the process. Thank you so much for your contribution. I've been speaking with Programs Manager, Yaga Africa, Paul James. We're back with more stories after this break. Stay with us, everyone. Show off your best skin this Harmerton with Nivea Nourishing Cocoa Body Lotion. Now with 5-in-1 Complete Care. The deeply nourishing formula prevents your skin from drying out. With precious cocoa butter and deep moisture for smooth and healthy looking skin. Love your skin this Harmerton with Nivea Nourishing Cocoa 5-in-1 Complete Care. On the 18th of this month, TVC News correspondent Habida Lawa uh, took viewers on a trip to Umidoin community in Asa local government area of Kwara State to meet the people who seem to have resigned to the fate of a life without access to portable water. For more than two decades, the people in these communities do not have access to water and other basic social infrastructure. But respite seemed to be coming their way as the report has gotten the attention of the state government. 48 years old Rafa Tumusa comes to the place where deceased members of her family were buried. She still mourns their death after many years. They died of illnesses caused by the lack of portable drinking water. Rafa too lives here in Omidoni, a rural community in Ote as a local government area of Kwara State, north central Nigeria. This community once had a dam that was the major source of water for the entire area and contiguous communities. In Omidoni, Sata, Akokwari, Idibo and Ishara, water is a luxury that even money can't buy. Every day they walk kilometers through this footpath to their only source of water. We are on our way to the only source of water for this community, which is a mother pool. The water is extremely bad. Not Musa Akombi is the mortgage of Omidoin community. The rural dwellers here look up to him for leadership, but one thing he cannot guarantee is the availability and access to portable water. When there is dry season, we are always looking for where to dig to get water. We wake up as early as 4 a.m. to rush to the paddle to get the first fetch. We then buy alum and use it to purify it. The people in these communities are predominantly farmers and they grow tubers like yam and cassava. This community thrives mainly on rain-fed agriculture, but probably not only the humans are denied of water, but also their crops. 
Rafa Tumusa tells me how the lack of water has affected their hygiene and sanitation. This is our only source of water and we don't drink it and feel okay. Our Joining me now is um, the Chairperson House Committee on Information, Sport, Youth and Tourism in Kwara State House of Assembly, Rukayat Shitu. Uh, thank you for joining us on the news this hour. Interestingly, Omidoi is loosely translated water has turned into honey. But the kind of water I've seen in this report doesn't taste any way like honey. Talk to us about the steps taken by the state government to bring some, you know, some relief to these people. Uh, good afternoon, Femi. Uh, firstly, I would love to tell you more about Omidoi. Omidoi falls under my constituency, which is Owojo Niri in Otebala Ward. Immediately, we saw the report on TVC. That was some weeks ago. We drove down to the community to check to check them and how their situation is. So fortunately enough, when we got to the village, when we even showed them the video that we saw, they told us that the, the video tends to be false. Like none of, they cannot recognize anybody in this video. And before now, the government already had put in place so many initiatives, which even water, provision of water, accessible water is part of. So. When the reporter, uh, when I contact the reporter, like I have went to the village and the villagers, the resident told me that they are not the one. They can't even recognize the person, the women in the video. So I later uh, saw that there, there is uh, a connection between the reporter and this man. That because even the reporter told me that immediately we left the man, Musam, uh, can be called a. Uh, that we came to the village. And I was like, why is he acting in that way? Why is he not giving us the accurate report? Unfortunately, you know, only there is a village whereby only seven people are living in this village with this man. It has only two roofs. And there is a, uh, let me, a two minute uh, walk away from, a two minute borehole, like away from that village, a solar bowl, which is Presently, I, when we, we, we get there, we, they told us that it is 40, and we promised that we are going to do that immediately, and we commence the work immediately. So, aside that... Uh, Hold on, Honorable uh, Shiti. Help us, let us, let us get proper perspective to your position. Are you saying that the, the place indicated in our report is not Omidoi? This is what I'm trying to tell you that when we first get to the village, the man, Musa Akambi and some other people told us that the report is false, that they cannot even recognize anybody in the video. We had to walk around the village. None of those places shown in the video that we saw while we were on our So what you are so saying <laughs> now, categorically honorable, is that only doing, only doing as portable water for the resident. Is that your claim? I am. Please let me learn. Let me learn. We don't have all the time. So That's why I need you to get to the point as fast presently, as possible. Presently, you know, I told, I told you that there are some initiatives that the state government is doing. And part of the initiative, when the reporter was composing his report, well, our report, it, she did not, as I'm speaking as a journalist, that whenever you want to do a report, there should be a balanced one. I mean, balance and accurate report. When Honorable Shutu, does Omidoye have... So, Portable, portable, water portable water for the resident. That's the question. I said three days ago, as part of the initiative, we've already laid down that we've already planned for the community. Omidoi has gotten a water four days ago, including a village. Along so Omidoi just got the water community. apparently after this report was done. No, let me. You, you, you're trying to put this together. Can I explain myself properly? Go ahead, please. What I'm trying to say is this report is more like a politically uh, interest report. Because when we got to the village to ask the man that we saw that the reporter confirmed that this is the exact village, then I later learned that the, 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 the husband of the reporter came from that village. And there is just a two-minute away walk 
from that particular village. There is a solar motorized, a solar bowl in that area. Okay, so you're saying that there is a borehole in Umidui that gives portable yes. water to the people. Yes. And that bowl was um, sit I mean, was done at what time? The bowl was done four days ago, and even the reporter was contacted that we've done the bowl. I later learned that TVC still aired the same report three days ago, even after we started the project in Omidoi and some other communities. Well, it is apparent that Omidoi only got relief some four days ago, and I think that settles this conversation. That's our time. Rukhaya Tishitu, thank you so much for talking to us on the news this hour. We're back with business news after this break. Stay with us, everyone. Every major news story is with many perspectives and layered with different levels of impact. Hello. What time did this happen? We will be right there. At TVC News, we follow the big and major news, gathering the facts, witnessing the outcome. I am here live at the aftermath of the approval of the new national minimum wage. We are TV station of the year, not just for breaking news, but for being first, fair and accurate. TVC News, first with breaking news. Sometimes it's the story that calls. At other times, the people just want to be heard. Can't continue like this. Their voices were echoing through time itself. We haven't done anything. If the, the tide is high, everybody run for safety. Their tears leave a sweet, sour taste for all. Their demands, a familiar call beckoning for change. In our world, no one expects a disaster to happen. But when it does, we'll be there to x-ray all sides, from the east to the west north and south. Committee Forum will examine the oddities and challenges to economic development as well as issues yearning for government intervention. Watch fresh episodes of Community Forum on Sundays by 9.30 p.m. only on TVC News. If you're just joining us, this is TVC News at 1. Let's turn attention to business now. Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission says active rigs in the oil sector have increased from 11 in 2011 to 30. The chief executive of the Regulatory Commission, Mr. Agbenga Komalafe, said the country recorded capital expenditure worth billions of dollars within the last two and a half years on the back of the implementation of the Petroleum Industry Act. His effort had also led to the restoration of investor confidence and the creation of certainty and predictability in the sector. According to him, the NUPROC is working to ensure the effective implementation of the statutory mandate of the Commission. Mr. Gwinga Komalafe said these efforts birthed the introduction of the crude oil measurement regulation, which was the first in Nigeria's over 70 decades of oil and gas production, which will also save the country. A huge amount. All the way from there now, the Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise is asking the Central Bank of Nigeria to peg the customs duty exchange rate at a thousand naira per dollar for the rest of the year. The chief executive uh, officer of Center, Dr. Moda Yusuf, gave this advice in a statement in Lagos. According to him, the appeal is in line with the federal government's commitment to ease the current hardships on the citizens and the burden on businesses. He welcomed the decision of the APS Bank to approve the use of the exchange rate reflected on the import documentation form M at the onset of the import transaction. This, he said, is a laudable response to the grievances of investors in the economy and will reduce the current uncertainty ground around import and related transactions in the economy. And now, in the face of the ongoing economic challenges affecting many Nigerians, there's a growing call for governments at all levels 
to actively promote the production and consumption of locally made goods. His call to action was echoed during discussions at the Africa Social Impact Summit held in Lagos. The stakeholders emphasized the need for government intervention to create a conducive business environment that supports local producers, thereby attracting foreign direct investment and reducing the country's reliance on imported goods. And outside Nigeria now, Asian shares stalled short of seven-month high highs. The day as investors awaited inflation data from the United States, Japan, and Europe that will help refine expectations for future rate moves. S&P 500 futures and Nasdaq futures were both trading 0.2% lower. Eurostock 50 futures and Fuxi futures both eased 0.2%. MSDS Brodex Index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan dipped 0.3%, having climbed. 1.7% last week on to seven month high. Chinese stocks jumped almost 10% as many sessions on hopes for more aggressive stimulus as blue chiefs were off 0.5%. Japan's Nikkei rose 0.3%, having climbed 1.6% last week to clear a previous record high as bulls looked to test the 40,000 barrier. All the way from there now, Venezuela and Turkey foreign, Turkish foreign ministers say they are committed to advancing towards a trade exchange of about 3 billion U.S. dollars in their economic relations. Venezuelan Foreign Affairs Minister Van Gieu said the trade exchange between the two countries reached about 800 million U.S. dollars in 2023 and will be increased to $3 billion this year under the instruction of the president of the two countries. He said the trade cooperation between Turkey and Venezuela is growing and the exchange and import and export of products between the two countries are becoming increasingly important. On its part, Turkish Foreign Minister Mr. Hakan Fidan said Venezuela plays a very important role in Turkish plans in the Latin American region and that Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will visit Caracas this year. He said Turkic energy companies are interested in participating in exchanges with Venezuela. On the way from the now Facebook owner Meta has unveiled plans to launch a dedicated team to combat disinformation and harms generated by artificial intelligence ahead of the upcoming European Parliament elections. Meta's head of European Union Affairs, Mashu. Uh, Panshini said the European Union Specific Elections Operations Center will bring together experts from across the company to focus on tackling misinformation, influence operations, and risk related to the abuse of AI. He said Meta's effort to address the risk posed by AI will include the addition of a feature for people to disclose when they share AI-generated videos or audio. And that's all we have time for on Business News at this hour. Every second, every minute, every hour, and every day, time doesn't just take away. It's a countdown to political decisions that shape our world. This country must move in. Imagine the impact these decisions have on our lives. Some are consequential, others may leave us intrigued or baffled. You will have no better friend and partner than a year. Step in and feel the frenzy like never before. Join me every weekday for an hour of fact-finding interviews but questions cut to the core. What does Sinumbu have that other 17 candidates do not have? I will dig in to get to the heart of issues, 
from local politics to global insight. Join me as I unearth the power plays, jaw-dropping revelations and the unfiltered truth. This isn't just politics, it's unraveling the stories that matter. Brace yourself for Politics Tonight every weekday at 8 p.m. where every decision echoes along the corridors of our lives. Politics Tonight, only on CBC News. The Inspector General of Police has met with senior officers to review the state of security. We are continuing our coverage of the arrest of Godwin Amephiele. The Senate has summoned the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria to properly brief the Senate regarding the state of the economy. President Bola Tinubu has announced the total removal of fuel subsidy. The first subsidy is gone. Water will never take its threat. Let's now bring you more development from Ibadan, the your state capital, where an explosion has taken place. Tell us about this incident. Hello and welcome to sports. Uh, let's begin with uh, the Carabao Cup. Vigil van Dijk's had a tip into extra time, gave an understrength Liverpool a remarkable final win over Chelsea at Wembley. Van Dijk had seen a header contentiously ruled out for offside on the hour, but there was no reprieve for Chelsea when it glanced home another from Simicas corner in the 118th minute. Liverpool's 10th triumph in the competition was achieved without a host of injured stars, including forward Mohamed Salah, Darwin Nunes and Diego Jota. It means Jurgen Klopp's side have achieved the first part of the potential quadruple uh, in the manager's farewell season. must have won the Carabao Cup. Simicas's delivery was perfect and Van Dijk got there first. I got told outside that there's an English phrase, you don't win trophies with kids. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, right in you. Um, it's, it is in my well, longer career than mine, but in my more than 20 years, easily the most special trophy I ever won. It's absolutely exceptional. I, I, and we, 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 sometimes I get asked if I'm proud of this, proud of that, proud of that. And it's really tricky. I, I don't know. I would wish I wish I could feel pride more often. Just don't do. Tonight was an overwhelming feeling. I was, oh my God. Right away from that, now Nigeria's uh, senior women's football team, the Super Falcons, and their Cameroonian opponents had their final training session on Sunday evening at the Man Bowl of the Moshuda Biola Stadium in Abuja. Both teams are preparing for the return leg of their Olympic qualifier scheduled this evening in Abuja. Our correspondent, Jane Moise, tells us more about it. Nigeria's Super Falcons are fighting for a ticket at the 2024 Paris Olympics after 16 years of absence. The team play the return leg of their third round Africa Olympics qualifier against the indomitable Lannises of Cameroon after a barren draw in Douala. Nigeria's coach Randy Waldrum, who is returning to the team after the round of 16 exit at the last World Cup in Australia, New Zealand, and Cameroon's coach Jean Baptiste Bisek, understands what is at stake in this fixture. The players came together and performed at the World Cup. Um, you know, I think we want to build on that. We don't want to take steps backwards, if at all possible. So, um, you know, we, we want to come in and, and replicate uh, the victory and qualify for an Olympics, which we haven't done for many years. Stand in captain of the Super Falcons, Rashida Tajibadi, scored the lone Nigeria goal to three Cameroon's Lannises out of the Women's Africa Cup of Nations in Morocco 19 months ago. She also netted two goals that eliminated Ethiopia in the second round of this qualifying series and is confident that the Nigerian team can excel at this round of the qualifier. Uh, by the grace of God, but the most important thing is uh, the team must win. So it's not about who scored the goal. 
it's just going to be, we have to win, we have to play to win for whoever scores. So long Nigeria scale through to the fourth round of the uh, qualification stage. So that's what's more important to me. Um, yeah, um, this is very normal because she's uh, one of the um, biggest um, player ever in the um, African, um, in the Cameroon um, female national team. Um, it has been a very big um, dis disadvantage to us, but um, we are going to do our best, even if um, she's not here, but we are going to play as if she's still with us. Minister of Sports Development John Eno was at the stadium on Sunday evening to observe the training session and also show his support for the Super Falcons. They are rated the best in Africa. You know, so nobody expects anything different from victory tomorrow. You know, so for me, as sports development minister, it was important to come, watch them train, and have one, one or two things to say to them to encourage them. The teams perfected their tactics during training on Sunday evening at the main bowl of the Mushida Biola National Stadium ahead of the crunch fixture on Monday by 4 p.m. Jane Francis Nweze, TVC News, Abuja. And Nigeria's D Tigers suffered their third consecutive defeat at the Afro Basket uh, 2020 on the 21st of February. What well, that's sports this hour. Doubt and fear doesn't occur at the canvas, it shows in the canvas. It shows the conation of raw ether material slapped, stroked and molded at a pace provided by the doubt and fear. Every move weigh in the struggle of one to the other, merging the past to the present, brush strokes of colors seen but not known, for when the wailing stops, the pieces settle down in abject beauty erected for a century of a century. Speaking advocating, protesting, as the arts are meant to be. Voted as the best TV station of the year. TVC News breaks into the core of every event as they happen. Following all nationwide big and impactful stories. Without the news from every perspective, covering every human angle. I am Veronica, bringing you the news you would want to watch. Lagos is the most visited state in Africa as the fifth largest economy on the continent. Covering the state and its government is no me feat, it's a busy beat. We go beyond the curtain of tapes to travel in far into the deep. I want to thank the Lagos State Government for the healthcare facility to bring stories that cut across all spectrums. A greater Lagos. Shall be we tell you stories that define our collective well-being as Lagosians. Amadido Jasalamadini, I live in Lagos, inside Lagos. Outside Nigeria now, due to the escalating violence in the occupied West Bank and war in Gaza, uh, Palestinian Prime Minister uh, Mohammed Shitaye has announced the resignation of his government, which rules part of the occupied West Bank. Prime Minister Shitaye, who submitted his resignation to President Mahmoud Abbas on Monday, said the decision to resign came in light of the unprecedented escalation in the West Bank and Jerusalem, as well as the war, genocide, and starvation in the Gaza Strip. The Prime Minister's decision is coming as U.S. pressure grows and President Abbas to shake up the Palestinian Authority and begin work on the political structure that can govern a Palestinian state following the war. And that's the news this hour. You can get more updates on our website, tvcnews.tv, on followers on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, or X at tvcnewsng. We're live on YouTube. Ativas News Nigeria. Up next is Business Nigeria. Stay with us.
the TVC News at 7 and the TVC News. Akiwande Ulu Ali Shoinka was born on 13th July 1934 in Abelkuta, Nigeria to parents Samuel and Grace Shoinka. His education began with the Christian lessons of his parents as well as the more traditional Yoruba spiritual customs Nigeria to study African theatre during which time he continued to produce poems and plays, one of which appeared on Nigerian television. Shortly after he became the chief of the Cathedral of Drama at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria had only recently gained independence from Britain and political corruption was at high. During cast plays and poems became increasingly political and he began giving speeches protesting government corruption. He was accused of conspiring with the Biafra rebels. He was therefore arrested and imprisoned in 1967 for almost two years during the civil war but managed during his time to write numerous poems. He was finally released in 1969 after a brief period in France. He returned to his position at the university where he founded the magazine Black Orpheus. He left his position and Nigeria in 1971, wary of the political climate of the country. During this time, he published books of poetry and essays. His plays were collected and published, and newer plays were staged. In 1986, he was the first African to win the Nobel Prize in Literature for a wide cultural perspective and with poetic overtones fashioning the drama of existence. He dedicated his acceptance speech to Nelson Mandela and used the platform to criticize apartheid. Later that same year, Joe Inka was awarded the Ajib Prize and in 1988 published his book Mandela's Earth and all the poems as well as art, dialogue, and outrage, essays on literature and culture. He also accepted a position at a Cornell University. Throughout his life, he has served as a spokesman against apartheid and government corruption. He has won numerous other awards for his work, including the Anisfield Wolf Book Award, the Academy of Achievement Golden Plate Award, and the Egypt Prize for Literature. And he has taught at many prestigious universities, including Emory University, Harvard, and Obafemi Awolowo University. In his lifetime, Shoinka has published two novels, three collections of short stories, made three movies, translated two novels, five memoirs, seven poetry collections, 13 essay collections, and produced nearly 30 plays. He holds honorary doctorates from numerous universities and has been invited to teach in schools around the world. He continues to write prolifically in spite of a bout with prostate cancer in 2014. Wally Shoinka, the Nigerian playwright and political activist, has positioned himself as a voice of the voiceless through his piece of art. He has distinguished himself as the African icon that continuously makes a mark in African literature and the world at large. understanding tax administration in Lagos State and the complex nature of Nigerian tax law. Do you know what agency or tier of government collects the various types of taxes? Have you ever found yourself asking any of these questions? Join us for your favorite program. The Tax Talk, your infotainment program. Lagos is the most visited state in Africa as the fifth largest economy on the continent. Covering the state and its government is no me feat, it's a busy beat.
Hello there, thank you for joining us. It's the start of the business week. I am Frank Omalape. Our top stories now. Nigeria active oil rigs record over a hundred percent increase. That's according to NUPRC. And CPPE wants CBN to pack the customs duty exchange rate at a thousand naira per dollar. And outside Nigeria, Asian shares drift ahead of inflation test. Well, those are the top stories to watch out for today on the program. On our interview segment on the show today, we'll stay on the Monetary Policy Committee meeting under the new governor uh, of Central Bank, Governor of Nigeria, Mr. Olayemi Kadosu, which begins today. And in the second half of the show, we will stay on monetary policy as a CBN reversed regulatory and a supervisory guideline and impact on FX. That's, of course, what we'll be looking at. What does this mean for the BDCs and, of course, for the entire market? Of course, we'll get the conversation going in a moment. But let's bring you up to speed with some news now. And now Nigeria, Offstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission says active rigs in the oil sector have increased from 11 in 2011 to 30. The chief executive of the Regulatory Commission, Mr. Gwinga Komalafe, said the country recorded capital expenditure worth billions of dollars within the last two and a half years on the back of the implementation of the Petroleum Industry Act. He said the effort had also led to the restoration of investor confidence and the creation of certainty and predictability in the sector. According to him, the NEUPROC is working to ensure the effective implementation of the statutory mandate of the Commission. Mr. Gbinga Komolafe said this effort bethed the introduction of the crude oil measurements regulation, which was the first in Nigeria's over 70 decades of oil and gas production, which will also save the country a huge sum. And in the meantime, the Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprises is asking the Central Bank of Nigeria to peg the customs duty exchange rate at a thousand naira per US dollar for the rest of the year. The chief executive officer of the center, Dr. Muda Yusuf, gave this advice in a statement in Lagos. According to him, the appeal is in line with the federal government's commitment to ease the current hardships on the citizens and the burden on businesses. He welcomed the decision of the APS Bank to approve the use of the exchange rate reflected on the import documentation from M at the onset of the importation transaction. This, he said, is a laudable response to the grievances of investors in the economy and will reduce the current uncertainty around the import and related transactions in the economy. Well, let's get, get started on our first conversation on the show. As experts anticipate a shift towards tighter monetary policies to combat inflation and stabilize the Naira, all eyes are on the ongoing Monetary Policy Committee meeting under the leadership of Dr. Yemi Kadoso, with expectations running high for potential adjustment to the benchmark interest rate, known as the monetary policy rate. Speculations abound regarding the extent of tightening necessary to address prevailing economic challenges, specifically against the backdrop of rising inflation and currency depreciation. The decision makers of the MPC are tasked with charting a course that balances price stability with sustainable growth. Well, that's it. So, to discuss this, I'm joined by the group CEO, Kari Asset, Limited Mr. Johnson Chuku. He joins me virtually now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chuku, for your time. Well, it's good to see you again. This meeting is expected to set a turn for future policy directions and market sentiment. Being the first MPC meeting under Mr. Cardoso, what are the key expectations and concerns regarding the MPC meeting and its potential outcomes? Let's start from there. Okay, thank you, Frank, for having me. Um, I'll start with the uh, key expectations. One of the key expectations is that the Monetary Policy Committee, as currently reconstituted, will move the monetary policy rate with Titan. Uh, at the meeting holding today and tomorrow. Yeah. And why would we expect that they will tell them? We expect them that they will increase the monetary policy rate beyond the 18.75%. And um, bear in mind that every decision taken by the monetary authorities in the past few weeks indicates a very strong uh, tendency towards tightening. 
We've seen the central bank and debt management office withdraw about 6.6 .6 trillion naira from the economy in the past three or four weeks. And then um, we've also seen the, uh, the central bank issue treasury bills, the 364 treasury bills at 19% with effective yield of more than 20%. So clearly, those are indications of uh, the, old, the, the thought process or the policy orientation of the monetary authorities. And as it stands today, it would not make sense for them to keep rates, NPR, at 18%, 5%, when even Treasury bills is trading about 19%. Um, so I, I think clearly we should expect a, a material increase in monetary policy rates. What are the underlying current? One, we've seen an inflation rate at 29.9% to a 28-year 20 year high, which clearly calls for a need to apply some policies to moderate inflation. Of course, we have always said that inflationary pressures today is not largely driven by uh, excess liquidity. Of course, there is a liquidity suffix as a result of ejection of uh, liquidity to the economy from the ways and mid funding of the federal government. But the other factors that are actually driving up inflation, food production, pass through effect of exchange rate depreciation. The other factor that is make, makes it compelling or that may uh, inform the decision of the Monetary Policy Committee to tighten is the pressures on uh, foreign exchange. Uh, we've seen Naira touch one, more than 1,900 Naira to dollar a couple of days back, although it has clawed back to about 1,600 or thereabouts. Uh, so these are two factors that will likely propel uh, the uh, decision of the Monetary Policy Committee. On the converse, we are also dealing with an economy that grew at 3.46 percent in the last quarter of last year, and about 2.74 percent in the full year 2023, which also indicates that even with a moderate tightening, uh, in as much as that could lead to slowdown in economic growth, but it may not tip the economy into a recession because the growth of 3.46 percent was one of the best we saw in the past few quarters. So those are factors that will uh, basically inform the decision the Monetary Policy Committee will take today and tomorrow. Mm. So, so it, it, your, specifically your expectation is that we are likely to see a review, an upward review in the NPR, isn't it? Absolutely. I expect that we should see an increase in monetary policy rate by at least a minimum of 100 basis points. But I suspect it could actually increase above more than, by more than 100 basis points. Mm. Should that happen, what implication would that have on you know, investor confidence, uh, activities in the market, in the stock market, in the fixed income market, uh, and all of that? Uh, I think you need to give us an understanding of what may happen going forward should you know, that happen. You know, if you look at what I said earlier, um, what I actually said is that the interest rate environment has completely overtaken the current monetary policy rate, which was last uh, adjusted in July last year. Mm -hmm. uh, like I did, I did mention earlier, the um, treasury bills rate, the 64 days bills is trading at a yield, I mean, at the primary market of more than 19%, the effective yield of more than 20%. Uh, we've seen um, even uh, the 182 day bills uh, two weeks ago was uh, sold at 18%. 18%. Um, and then the one of last week was also sold around 17.5%. Uh, so we, we are dealing with a, a, a market yield environment that has made uh, the current monetary policy rate no longer uh, relevant. So it has to be adjusted to be reflective of, um, of um, the current uh, interest rate environment. Secondly, a lot of banks are going to the standing lending facility uh, uh, of the central bank to borrow. And they, cannot, they are borrowing at um, um, NPR plus 5%, I think at, at plus 5%. So if NPR is increased, then that will make it more uh, a punitive for the banks to come and borrow. And therefore, we discourage further credit creation, particularly for banks that don't have strong liquidity. So that's another factor you have to look at, that the NPR has to be adjusted to remain the anchor rate in the economy. As it stands today, it had been made obsolete by the decisions earlier taken by the central bank and the general macroeconomic environment that relates to interest rate. So what would be the impact, impact on equity market, a fixed income market? Uh, ideally, when you have a material increase in uh, fixed income rates, your portfolio investors will underweight, adjust their portfolios and underweight them in equities and overweight them in fixed income instruments. So we should expect that as this EB trend continues, that there will be some sell down in equities 
Of course, we've seen some level of moderation in equity uh, market gains in the past few weeks. Obviously, in response to the high, to the sharp increase in, uh, in interest rates on at the TBS market. So, uh, uh, and then we should also expect that investors will rather put their money into the fixed income space, which is why I said earlier that in the past four weeks or thereabout, the monetary policy, the monetary authorities and the debt management office has sucked out, uh, withdrawn about 6.6 .6 trillion naira, which means investors are really scrambling. If you look at what happened last week, uh, total treasury bill sales was more than 1.5, about 1.45 trillion uh, naira in a single week. And a fortnight earlier, about 1 trillion naira was sold in the uh, TB, in the uh, money market, in the short end of the money market, or the short, short end of the money market, that is the treasury bill market. So these are indications of where investors are putting their money. Um, as it relates to possibility of equity uh, price adjustment, material equity price adjustment, which I've actually feared, um, that may be delayed until we begin to see publications of full year results of quoted companies. Uh, because a huge part of, uh, portion of the investment now in the market is held by uh, institutional investors like the PFS who will tell you they are there for the long haul. But I think as we uh, move towards a high yield uh, fixed income environment, then ultimately the, um, the portfolio investors like the PFAs will also have no choice than to adjust their uh, portfolios in, in favor of fixed income instruments. Mm. Interesting insights there. Uh, you know, some, some have called for the need to strike a balance between stimulating economic growth and managing inflation as it were. In addition to monetary policy, what, what fiscal measures do you believe are crucial to addressing Nigeria's macroeconomic challenges at this time? Well, uh, Frank, the most important fiscal measure that uh, will contribute to addressing the general college macroeconomic environment is improved food production. And to food, improve food production, we have to deal with the issue of insecurity in the major seafood base of the country, as well as insecurity in the uh, uh, oil-bearing communities. Those are the two most critical uh, actions that the fiscal authority can take. Because if you have in, in, increased food production, food prices will come down, that, because food uh, components account for more than 60% of the uh, basket of consumer price index. And if you have a food inflation about 35% in, uh, in January, and you can bring it down to uh, maybe sub 10%, you can imagine the impact on overall inflation, all item inflation. And then if you have improved crude production, you're going to see uh, improvement in foreign exchange earnings, improvement in foreign reserves, stabilization of exchange rate, and possibly appreciation of the Naira which will reduce the pass-through effect of net depreciation on commodity on, on prices. So those are the two major things that the fiscal authority have to do. The third factor is to moderate or possibly eliminate borrowing by ways and means, uh, which is injecting liquidity into the economy that is not backed by productive activities. And then the fourth element is to reduce the amount of um, foreign exchange, um, crude oil sales proceeds that they shared to the three tiers of government and the higher exchange rate. Of course, we're dealing with the exchange rate about, about 1,400, 1,500 today, even if you use the I and E window rate. And if you convert whatever is earned from uh, crude oil sales, which for me is similar to economic rent, it leads to uh, injection of liquidity that is not bad, but productive activities. And that liquidity eventually uh, finds itself into the market and propel a uh, higher uh, supply of money without commensurate increase in, in goods and services. So those are the factors I think the fiscal authorities can deal with. I can dwell further on that as we progress in this conversation. Mm. I mean, in recent time, we've seen the, you know, the presidency uh, give a directive um, you know, to re release grain from the National Reserve. So it's expected that that directive, when implemented, should perhaps drive down the course of... Uh, you know, food prices in the, in the market. Uh, also, we, we've seen uh, on the monetary side, we've seen the CBN clamp down on BDCs as well. Recently, they also issued a directive. Uh, so if you put all of this together, uh, how soon are we close to, you know, you know bringing all of these heat down uh, with regards to the cost of living, the high cost of living, the prices of food items, and of course, the uh, inflation that is also biting hard vis-a-vis uh, -vis the exchange rate volatility as well. Okay, in the first place, um, bear in mind that uh, we do not have so much 
uh, food in the silos. Uh, they, uh, we don't have so much uh, food reserve in the country. That is, some states have actually said they have nothing in the silos in their states. So the amount of food that will be released uh, from the reserves or the silos uh, is minimal and we have very little effect on food supply. But most importantly, food is what is consumed daily. Uh, whatever you have in your strategic reserve will not satisfy a daily consumption because food consumption is like a flow. And a one-off supply or release of uh, strategic reserve of grain will hardly scratch this and will not move the needle. Um, what matters is that we restore food production and then the challenge we are going to have will be for a season. But if we do not restore food production, it's difficult for you to satisfy the demands for food based on what you have in your strategic reserve. And, and again, the government does not have so much watches, so much of uh, income as to import food on a consistent basis to meet the demand of a 220 million population. So I, I think uh, that is, would be a stopgap, uh, temporary palliative, like applying uh, pain relief to uh, a chronic uh, um, dislocation uh, um, uh, fracture. You only have a relief, and then once it wears out, the pain will come back uh, until you do the necessary operation, which is what we need to do to improve food, uh, food production. Then the second aspect of your question as it relates to um, the impacts of this current pursuit of B BDCs by uh, law enforcement agencies, I think it is uh, wrong, wrong headed. It doesn't solve any problem. The BDCs are not market makers in foreign exchange. Neither do they generate the demand, nor they generate the supply. So they are not, they are just a market where a person who needs something comes and a person who is selling something will come to. Because both of them know if you go there, you sell. If you go there, you buy. So uh, uh, pursuing them around does not de uh, address the issue of demand and supply. Does not address the issue of the fact that supply is far below demand. I think what we should do is focus on uh, the critical issues of improving supply. Demand management which is what they have been doing, um, has, can, does not have enduring impact if you do not improve supply. Because there's a limit to what, uh, to say you can constrain demand, particularly if you're coming with this population. But in terms of disrupting the market or market space, it doesn't address the fact that I need to come to London, I need to buy FX, so I need to pay for my hotel accommodation, I need to pay uh, uh, for taxes or trends uh, movement around if I'm in the outside the country. Uh, and then and, and, and then I'm coming back, I live in London, I'm coming back to Nigeria, and I have a thousand pounds, I need to change it, I need to go somewhere and uh, get Naira. It doesn't address that. And that's what basically the role the BDC are, are there to, to address. But I think the Central Bank has also realized that, and they are trying to formalize the BDCs and um, make them an integral, <clears throat> or they saw them as integral part of the financial system. Certainly, you need a market for those who demand the product and those who supply the product. Mm. I'm going to let you go in, uh, you know, in a few minutes, uh, Mr. Chuku. Uh, let, let's talk about, back to Dr. Cardoso at the, at the helm of affairs, renowned for his attitude inside in, in banking and you know, strategies. What structural reforms or policy changes would you recommend for ensuring a long-term economic resilience uh, in the country? I think we need to look at that before I let you go. Well, uh, I had mentioned that I think the, the, the CBN governor, Kadosa, had also said that uh, one is that it's eliminating um, ways and means funding of the federal government so that we will eliminate that source of capital injection or liquidity injection into the economy that's not bad by productive activities and that we are going to adhere strictly to the fiscal responsibility act as well as the CBN that relates to uh, funding of the federal government. The second aspect that we have to deal with is as it relates to the amount, he had not mentioned that uh, the conversion of uh, um, proceeds of oil sales into the federation account uh, at higher exchange rate. There's nothing wrong with converting at the current higher exchange rate, but the issue is that we should go back and redefine or tighten our fiscal restraint act and ensure that any proceeds from uh, sale of oil that is shared to the state government and the federal government will only be devoted to capital infrastructure so that that the ejection is backed by productive activities, it's supported by productive activities, instead of just sharing and then we can, you see liquidity coming into the economy and without supporting productive activities, because, because we don't need really to spend money on producing crude. Uh, so it's like economic rent, and it has 
impact of liberty suffix. These are the minimal and a few other things in terms of um, um, eliminating or reducing uh, development finance initiative with the central bank said they will do. Of course, that's part of their measures to curb liberty into the economy. But sometime at some uh, point, you will need some intervention in some specific sectors of the economy. Probably what we need to do is activate those special arms of government or special agencies like um, uh, the uh, mortgage in the, um, uh, refinancing company to uh, provide mortgages instead of the central bank providing that, bank of industry to provide loans to the manufacturing sector instead of central bank providing that, bank of agriculture providing loans to the agricultural sector instead of the central bank providing that, so that the specialized financial institution that were set up to do these jobs are uh, enabled to carry them out instead of central bank playing the mini boss role that we've seen the central bank of Nigeria do in the past couple of years. Mm. A good place to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Group CEO, Carry Asset Limited, Mr. Johnson Chuku. Thank you for coming on Business Nigeria. Uh, do have a great day. Thank you for having me. Great insight there. Less on attention to other business now. But coming up in a moment on Business Nigeria, we'll shift our focus to looking at uh, the CBN revised regulatory and supervisory guidelines. And we'll look at the impact on FX uh, policy be joining, be joining, be joined by analyst and of course policy uh, analyst Mr. Sumbo Adib uh, Joko will be joining me on the show to look at these and what this mean for the BDCs and of course the FX market. This is Business Nigeria. You stay with us. week, Green Angle, in partnership with Wild Aid, will bring you a documentary series on environmental issues affecting Nigeria's amazing biodiversity, from climate change, air pollution, and wildlife conservation. We will be traveling across Nigeria to give you on-the-ground report of the issues affecting our environment. It airs every Saturday at 4.30 p.m., only on TVC News. Doubt and fear doesn't occur at the canvas, it shows in the canvas. It shows the conation of raw earthen material slapped, stroked and molded at a pace provided by the doubt and fear. Every move weigh in the struggle of one to the other, merging the past to the present, brushstrokes of colors seen but not known. For when the wailing stops, 